Welcome, dear listeners, to Horror Den of Misfits. And now, story time. A little over a year ago, my ex and I traveled to Yellowstone and spent most of the nights of our trip back country camping. On one of our last nights, we made it out to our reserved campsite around dusk and had just enough light to set up our tent and spot another tent at another campsite across a small pond from us, maybe 150 yards away or so. As we're cooking dinner we hear a man, presumably at the other campsite across the way abruptly yell, Hey Bear! To which we both felt very startled, quickly finished with our dinner, hung our food in a tree, and made it into our tent. Neither of us saw or heard any signs of a bear, and figured the other camper may have been practicing good bear safety by letting potential nearby bears know he was there. Later in the evening after finishing some sexy time, I sit up in the tent and look over across the pond to see what looks like headlamp or flashlight coming from the man's tent across the pond, and I notice that he seems to be pointed in our general direction and flashing it at odd intervals. I watch this for a while, then more amused than creeped out at this point decide it would be fun to join in. So I grab my headlamp and blink my light back at the man when he finishes flashing his, only to see him seem to respond by flashing his back. This went on for several minutes, and later a light appeared at the top of a small nearby mountain that appeared to be doing the same thing back to us. I don't know Morse code or am familiar with any kind of camping or hiking etiquette around signaling others with your headlamp or flashlight, but I'll always wonder what they might have been saying to me and me to them that night. I was hiking in the Carpathian Mountains and got a chance to talk with the local mountain rangers. A lone hiker had passed the ranger's cabin wearing sneakers as footwear and without gloves. It being winter, the rangers had told the guy that he's not properly equipped and should probably turn back, but without effect. Once it had been dark for a few hours and there was no sign of the hiker returning, they headed out for rescue. The guy was luckily found alive. He was lying bleeding in a pit in the snow with bloodstains all over himself and the surroundings. It turned out he had read that cutting your hands will keep you warm and prevent your fingers getting frostbitten. Maybe this guy got his mountain survival tips from YouTube gurus. Not my own personal story, but it's my brother's. He interned for the forestry department one summer after college. He was set up in a cabin in a remote part of some state park and alone all summer. After his internship ended he came home, and we all had a nice family dinner to welcome him back. We all were excited to hear about living in the sold and what it was like. He told us about the serenity of nature, and how loud yet quiet it was at the same time. Someone, not sure who, asked what the creepiest thing was. He looked at his all with this look of pure confusion and fear, almost like if you saw Bigfoot. He went on to tell us about this strange creature that loved under his front porch. He kept saying it was the strangest thing ever. It was like a cat that barked like a dog, and it would bars at him every night. He swore up and down that it was something out of an old Native American myth, and had to be supernatural because of course cats can't bark. We were all very curious and asked him to describe it. He said it was red, the size of a small dog, and had this big fuzzy tail. My other brother held up his phone and asked him if this was the strange creature he saw. He explained yes with the most amount of pure shock I've ever seen. It was a fox, my 24-year-old brother who wanted to work as a forest ranger had, apparently, never seen a fox before. Needless to say he didn't get a job offer. So I thought you all might be interested to hear a few of the stories my friend told me about his work as a state beach lifeguard. The state we live in is in the northern part of the US, 
and is one of the more popular beaches in our area. Aside for stupid, drunk and stoned people, there are also the mentally unstable. And then there's a few stories that he says, never really sat right with him. These few occurrences haven't ever really been solved. This happened when my friend was slightly younger, and pretty new as a lifeguard, maybe only his second or third year. By this time however, he was already pretty much ahead of everyone else in terms of responsibility and compassion. Every so often, they would get a call after the beach closed for the night that a kid would be spotted swimming in the deep end. Well, less swimming and more bobbing up and down, kind of treading water from side to side. The deep end is probably six or so feet deep, and is dangerous even for adults to go into since there's small occasional sinkholes that can make it much deeper. There's a kiddie section for children that's basically in the shallows, where children are supposed to be. And when the beach closes, no one is supposed to go into the water, though you can continue walking on the beach. Not knowing this, he gets a call in to go find this kid that's just been spotted, floating around in the deep end. He goes out to the beach and scans the area and spots the kid off in one of the corners of the pool, since they hadn't taken up the lines yet. He calls to the kid to come in, but the kid just kind of bobs around some more, and gives no indication he's coming out. So my friend is left with no option, but to go in after the kid which he does. My friend is an excellent swimmer, and reaches the deep end pretty quickly, only to find the kid had disappeared. Before he goes underwater to search, the kid surfaces past the line, about 10 to 15 feet away, still bobbing, and not saying a word. Friend calls out to him to swim his way, but the kid simply sinks back under without uttering a sound. Maybe there was something in the way he did it, but it apparently creeped out my friend. However, still being a good person at heart, he also submerges and swims out past the line to follow the kid. This happens twice more. The kid about 10 or 15 feet away from my friend, silent and bobbing, before sinking back down and resurfacing further away. My friend said he stopped when he realized the sun was down, and he could no longer see the beach. He said he turned around and swam straight for shore after the kid sunk down a third time. He called out for a water patrol basically him, and another lifeguard in a canoe, but finding nothing, told the park ranger to keep an eye out for the kid. Telling me this story, he said the kid was about eight or so, and definitely not capable of swimming out from the beach for such a long distance, and not get tired. He said there was definitely something eerie, and not right about the kid, completely silent, and just sinking down out of sight. As I mentioned before, a lot of stupid, drunk, high, and mentally unstable also frequent the beach. Since the beach is also surrounded by a rather dense and expansive state park, this compounds the danger and effort required to save people if they go missing. This summer, just as they were about to close, they get a report of an old woman who couldn't find her grandson. She seems slightly confused and dazed, and the guards had to keep questioning her to get answers. They eventually get out from her that he's about three, and the last time she saw him was in the water. He was playing at the edge of the water, and he just disappeared. So naturally, as according to protocol, they clear the water and go out in a line, calling for the kid. They get all the way to the deep end and find nothing, so they move off further down the beach, and still find nothing. They radio out to the park rangers and toll booth guard to keep an eye out for the kid. They look in the water for about another half hour before they get a report of a child matching the missing kid's description near the mouth of the park trail. They take the old lady and go find the kid he's got a long scratch down one arm, and he's wearing the bright blue swim trunks the lady said he had been wearing. However, his water shoes are gone and he had strands of lake weed stuck to his body. Bear in mind, this is about two or three miles from where he had been last spotted, and without having been abducted and brought there, it would have been impossible for him to travel that distance in that amount of time. Since he's very little, 
it's hard to get a clear answer out of him. But the little boy was very adamant that a lady with a big, big smile lead him out here. She promised him chocolate and wore some kind of a long dress. She hadn't been anyone he knew. And when he imitated her smile for them, he made a kind of hiss that little kids make when they're talking about monsters. At this point, he wasn't sure if the kid's imagination was just getting away from him, but the child also imitated the way the woman walked, which was backwards. Last one, since I feel like this must be getting pretty long. I've mentioned my friend is an excellent swimmer this last year, he's broken all his swimming records, and can go a mile without needing a rest which I find utterly ridiculous. He's always the one chosen to go for longer rescues, such as if someone has swum past the lines, or fallen from a boat or something. He's also the one who pulls the lines, which are anchored to the floor of the lake with heavy boys. Sometimes he says, he'll occasionally experiencing something, holding him down underwater. A few weeks ago, as he was gathering the lines, he very clearly felt someone settling onto his shoulders, as if sitting there. He dropped the lines and fought to throw the person off, thinking it was one of the other guards around. He managed to throw the person off, but upon resurfacing, he could find no one else in the water with him. Leaving the lines there, he nevertheless went back to shore gathered the rest of his guards, and gave them a sound chewing out about not roughhousing in the water, since it was a way people could get hurt. All the other guards denied being near the water, and after hearing the story, wouldn't approach the water for the rest of the night. My friend said he'd experienced the sensation before, but never so powerfully. Such as swimming a few times in the morning to get limbered up, he would feel something grab his ankle or wrist. He said it wasn't lake detritus or lakeweed, since he knew the feeling of both. It was as if someone had grabbed him and wouldn't let go, but each time the sensation vanished almost as quickly as it had appeared. He has a few more stories, and then stories from the park ranger, who has experienced even crazier shit, according to his stories. Part 2. I just helped the friend I'm talking about move. As I helped him pack, I asked him more about, the weirdest beach experiences, he's ever had. A lot of them involve just high people being high, or the mentally unstable as I've mentioned, but a few of them were pretty unexplainable. The first was this. This happened a few years ago, 2011, before I had even started dating my husband. My friends said one of the worst things they would get called to were fights and disturbances the lifeguards would get called even to the ones that weren't on the beach or in the water. These would technically have been the jobs of the park rangers, but the lifeguards would often respond and then have to call the park rangers. In this case, my friend responded to a harassment call. Some weird guy was apparently running out of the woods surrounding the parking lot and assaulting the patrons. So my friend got another guy and went up to the eastmost parking lot. Word apparently hadn't quite yet gotten around that people were being attacked here, because a few cars were still scattered about. They pulled into the parking lot, and, nothing. No one jumped out to run at them, the cars were abandoned just the hot sun and the smell of the lake a few hundred feet behind them. My friend said it was one of the eeriest sensations he ever remembered feeling. Even his friend not nearly as perceptive as he was felt as though they were being watched by something menacing. My friend radioed in, said there was no evidence of anyone being there, and turned the gator's engine over. And then, just as they were about to leave, something ran out of the woods. It definitely looked like a man. My friend said his first impression was that it was a person, running on their tiptoes, with their arms sickled out like wings. But the sound the person made wasn't anything either of them ever heard come out of a human being it was like a sort of white noise screaming. And there was something definitely wrong with his face at first glance, it looked lifeless and impassive almost like a mask that had been stretched into creases and wrinkles to form an expression. But if you looked closer, and my friend said this had been burned into his memory, 
If was as if he had another face underneath the human one, which moved and shifted separately from the one on top. He said he thought it was the thing underneath that had all those teeth. They tore the F out of the parking lot and away my friend said he noticed his co-worker had, for some reason, elected to try to drive to the main highway. Luckily, they ran across the park ranger responding to another call, but by the time they had stopped, no one had been behind them. They related their incident, and the ranger said he was responding to weird vandalizing and sightings of something along the lines of what the two of them had. A man, moving strangely and chasing people through the woods. Also, strange scratches on cabin doors and tears and tents. That had been the only summer that thing had been a problem. My friend said he just figured it was some asshole getting high, putting on a mask, and messing with people's heads. However, I think it has a bit to do with the next story. This next one has more to do with friend hanging out with husband than the beach, but I hope you'll still enjoy it. After work, our friend would drop by my husband's house, where he was still living with his parents. They would cook something, eat, play video games and watch TV. Basically, just hang out until friend had to go home and my husband to bed. Note, to avoid confusion since there's going to be a lot of he's and him's, I will call our friend Jerome and my husband Tyler. Our friend Jerome had been relating his beach mishaps to my husband to be Tyler, and his last story seemed to strike Tyler. Huh. He had said, scratching the back of his head. People around the farm have been seeing someone like that too. Mind you, most of the people who worked at the farm in 2011 were much like the people that inhabited the beach if they weren't owners, they were either stupid, drunk, high, or mentally unstable. Or Hispanic, and they were a superstitious bunch. According to Jerome, Tyler had said a couple of cows had been maimed, and at one point, one of the pens containing heifers had broken out and stampeded. They had been in quite a panic, running with a single mind away from something that, in Tyler's mind, had scared them. Several of the heifers had injuries on their sides, as though they had run up against something sharp. But upon later investigating the barn, nothing was found that could have caused such injuries on so many. Tyler said they had lost quite a few heifers that night some had run into the woods and not returned. One had fallen into a manure pit and drowned, and one was found killed in an inexplicable manner. Her throat had been cut, and her entrails dug out. Her hind legs had been broken, as if something had been trying to prevent her from running away. In the area we live in however, state park officials swear up and down, there's nothing that can kill a human, let alone a cow. Jerome said the Hispanic workers were swearing up and down, they've been seeing something skulking around the back barns, and would refuse to go do chores out there alone. Sometimes even in numbers they wouldn't go, and so lots of problems were caused. They had also been complaining of something scratching on their back doors at night, and tearing holes in screens. One, who quit after relating his experience, said he had heard someone knocking and calling out he had used the term singing right before he was getting ready to go to work at about one in the morning. He went to go see who it had been, and standing at the door had been a horrible man in a mask, with glowing eyes standing on his tiptoes. He slammed the door shut, freaked out, called the others awake, and they called Tyler's dad to come check it out. Nothing had been there, but it had been a few weeks after the incident with the heifers. I'm happy to say that I've never seen anything like what my husband and friend describe. I work on the farm as well, and visit the beach on occasion, and have never been molested by a man with sickle arms. I actually have to go to work, so I'm going to leave you with what I've written so far. I've got a ton more and our friend said he would be delighted to share his sister's stories as well, as she also works as a lifeguard. When I was a kid my dad, my bro and I would go hiking or camping a lot in the area around Mount St. Helens and Mount Rainier, 
We made camp one day, and eventually noticed a horrible, foul smell coming from who knows where. We assumed it was a dead animal. Also found a kind of lean-to and tarp structure like maybe a survivalist or homeless person would live in. Anyways, we left and several weeks later my dad learned that a lady was murdered and buried there and wasn't found until after we had been there. I don't know if my dad contacted authorities, and that's why she was found, or if it was just coincidence. So the smell was this dead lady. I didn't find this out until years later, as I was like 8 when it happened. My sister and I accidentally ended up on a ferry road when walking on paths in the public park in Scotland. I was 19 at the time and she was 13. We were accompanied by her dog. After about 15 minutes walking we got lost and she used her GPS on her phone to find we were miles away from where we had started. In the path behind us, the sunlight shimmered oddly, but no forms were distinct. I apologized aloud for having used their path, and gave an offering of the cool rocks and leaves I had picked up along the way, and my sister and I walked back the way we came. It took longer, more like 20 minutes, but we returned to the park after having been gone less than an hour. I have never encountered that path again, though I have visited the park many times since. Fairies are flesh and blood entities with the abilities to hide thoroughly and bend space-time. My supernatural experiences occasionally involve fairies for instance, mushroom rings appearing, but it isn't common. Usually, I just get a sense of otherness that could be fairies, but could be other entities. I am rather old now and have been engaged with fairy beings as long as I can remember, generally in a positive, admiring and respectful manner which has always been returned. They have been helpful, and I am grateful. My earliest memories of fairy beings are when I was still in my crib and several of the light-hearted sort used to line up along the walls, shine rather like little yellow birthday candles, and sit swinging their feet and watching me curiously. They were neither young nor old, neither adults nor children. I somehow knew without being told not to talk about them. It seemed to me that older and busier people could have seen them if they liked but chose to ignore them, particularly if they were the sort of hurried people who enjoyed creating drama and conflict. Our elderly Boston Bull Terrier had more sense and got on well with them. In fact, there were several elf-like beings, floor dwellers, who used to sneak tidbits to him and stroke his ears. We were fortunate enough to have brownie helpers. My father told me stories about them, while being careful not to cause offense by addressing them directly. I tried to learn by example. Although encouraged in my beliefs by my father and his family who were from Renfrewshire in Scotland, I had my troubles because of the fairy beings too. My allowance was taken away when it was discovered, I was leaving the coins for the fairies. I had several, invisible playmates. And whenever my mother heard more than one voice in the playroom she used to come and stare at me with disapproval and end the game. And I was very frightened at first by the bean shias who came to me when my family died. I do not know why, but I didn't need to be told what they were or what was happening. To my ears, their wailing sounded like the 118 howling of dogs or on several occasions, the calls of a hawk and I quickly lost my fear. They still come to me now. Not something I saw, but rather, something I heard. This past summer, my girlfriend and I through hiked the Colorado Trail. One morning, we're breaking down our camp, and the sun had just come up so it was still pretty early in the morning, maybe around 6, 6.30 a.m. We were camped in this long straight valley in the Lost Creek Wilderness, for any fellow CT through hikers. As we're packing up and getting ready to start hiking again, we can hear this crazy screaming sound, over and over again for maybe a couple minutes. It sounded pretty far off, but was echoing through the valley. We both sat there and listened to it, trying to figure out what it was. 
I have spent a lot of time in the Colorado mountains, and have never heard this sound before. At first, we thought it may have been a person, but we were at a fairly remote section of the trail. Once we finished, we did some research, and we think it may have been a mountain lion, as they sometimes will make a similar screaming noise, but who knows. We were both a little nervous to start hiking again after that. When I was a little girl growing up in West Auburn, Maine we had a horse farm and 60 acres of woods behind our four pastures. We lived in the country. I was born in 1959, and in my younger years I was visited often, but by what I thought was a nightmare, a gorilla in my window. I started screaming, I was so scared. My bedroom was on the second story, and its face took up the whole window. For many years I thought I was dreaming. I had that dream a lot. My mother would find me standing in front of the window screaming. I'd think I had a nightmare until in recent years when I read that Sasquatch looking through people's windows. It was then I realized that I was not dreaming. They had approached me in my younger years. I spent a lot of time in our woods riding my horse, cross-country skiing, taking long walks, and digging for old bottles. We had two ponds and a flowing stream about 20 feet or so wide that separated our property from the local ski area. There, there were a lot of eerie silences at times. I remember noticing that it was so quiet like time stood still. In 1979 I had some friends who lived at Sebago Lake, Maine. They lived in a cabin in the middle of the woods on a long hilly road only traveled by its residents. So you go up and down and not expect to see any other cars. I was driving up there one night, it was curvy, and I was coming around the last bend in the road. And there on the side of the road was an at least 8 to 10 foot tall Sasquatch. It was massive. It had to be 4 feet across shoulder to shoulder. It was a brownish blonde color, with heavy brow and high cheekbones. The skin was dark, sort of bearded, and kind of like he had bang fur and a big head. He looked both ape and human-like in that he was on two legs. The fur looked thick, and I guess about 3 to 4 inches long all over the body. He just stood there motionless looking at me. I was pretty freaked out when my headlights were on him. We made eye contact. He was not 10 feet from me. I just sped up and flew into my friend's driveway and ran and sang, I just saw a huge Bigfoot. In hindsight, nobody went looking. Nobody in my world talked about Bigfoot back then. In the summer on August 25, 2019, we randomly stopped on the side of the highway to use nature's facilities in New Hampshire along I-95, and there was an opening about 15 feet wide to enter the woods. I went in first and was shocked to see what I realized must be a roadkill dump spot, because there were vinyl gloves present. But also that appeared to be Bigfoot structures there to take advantage of this Buffett-style dining. I ran back and grabbed my phone. I zoomed into the structures hoping to see it better. It was about 20 feet away from my spot so the clarity is not good. But we appeared to have had company. Definitely not unexplainable but sent chills down my spine just the same. For context. I'm 25 and female with a long history of doing stuff out in nature, all by my lonesome sorry, mom and dad. Last year I quit my job as a cheesemaker, and hopped on a train for a position as a line cook at a little rundown family-owned Greasy Spoon on the res right outside Glacier National Park in Montana. They had a little trailer park out back for the staff, and I got to live in a one-room cabin the manager's granddad built back in the day. The park itself was just a 15-minute walk from my cabin, and I often went hiking on the Red Eagle Lake Trail, since it was the one trail I didn't need to wait around for a shuttle to access, and it tended to get less traffic than the others. I'd gone out there hoping to do lots of backcountry camping. But the cafe worked us like dogs six days a week, usually so I only made it out twice on a couple solos. Now, at Red Eagle Lake, there are two campsites, 
the upper and lower. The first time I camped I stayed at the lower campsite, which is usually more busy. The second and last time, right before I returned home, I stayed at the smaller upper campsite. When I got there I hung up my bear hang, set up my tent, and spent some time poking around the lake and watching deer till it got dark. Around 2 am I woke up to snuffling noises and loud, hollow footsteps right outside my tent door. Being half asleep and a dumbass, I completely unzipped my door. I meant to unzip the window, but the whole door opened, and I found myself looking up at a huge ass bull moose the size of a SUV. He had been just munching on huckleberry shrubs. He froze when he heard my door unzip, they don't see very well hesitated a moment, and then shot off into the hills faster than I could ever imagine something that big moving. Scared the shit out of me, I kept hearing other moose around me throughout the night, and actually it was kind of comforting. No spooky mountain lions or paranormal spooks could possibly be around, if there were moose, right? The next morning I packed up, and was humping my shit out past the lower campground. It had been empty when I passed it the day before, but now I noticed there was a group of a half dozen guys there. Now, I met lots of dudes on the trail and 99 perks and of them are perfectly friendly, really chill and harmless. But as I walked through this campground every head snapped up and clocked me as I passed through, and I felt panic alarms go off in my gut. They all stood totally still and didn't say a word. I had to walk right past one of these guys at the bear hang, and he just leered at me creepily and said, hey. I was wearing big, black sunglasses, and in my best lady bro voice shot back, I yo wash up. And then tried not to poop myself as I marched up the trail till they couldn't see me. I've spent a lot of time in the woods alone, and have often been grateful that I'm a taller, sort of stocky, and kind of androgynous lady. I've also spent a lot of time wandering Seattle late at night and early in the morning. That by far was the most in danger I've ever felt. Don't want to feel that way ever again. I live in the northwest part of New Mexico, and during the summer of 1992, I heard the weirdest story ever. My grandmother, being Navajo, lives about an hour south of where I live. It's a quiet and isolated part of the Navajo reservation. There's no running water, no electricity, no utilities whatsoever. I used to travel there on weekends to check up on my grandmother and my mother. One summer weekend, we took my grandmother over to her older sister's house to check on her, haul water, and bring her some much needed supplies. My grandma's sister is the oldest and lives alone in a two-room house. The entry of the house is used as a living room and a kitchen. The bedroom is another room separated by a wall adjacent to the kitchen. She is very old-fashioned and has no electronics and is isolated from the rest of the world. She does not speak English and only speaks Navajo. Her only advanced technology is an old AM radio and a D-cell flashlight. When we arrived, she told us the strangest story. She said that one night she woke up and her room was totally lit up. She said it was like the sun came up, and she thought she overslept. The lady is awake before the sun is up, and she usually does her morning prayers before the sun is up, so she was somewhat distressed that she had slept in that long. She said that she sat up in her bed and started to walk into her kitchen. Then all of a sudden it went dark. It gets dark on the reservation, so dark that most times you can't even see your hand in front of your face. She was startled and went back to bed. A few nights later, she was awakened by the dishes in her kitchen banging together. She said that her room was lit up again just like before. She said the sun came up, and she got up to investigate what was making the noise. As she walked towards the doorway, she heard a little child run across the doorway. She was surprised, and when she got to the doorway, she saw the little children run and hide from her. She got upset and grabbed her broom. When she grabbed her broom, it darkened again. Everything was quiet and dark. 
No little children in sight. She was upset and wanted to know what was going on. She asked us if we had any information on what was going on and why in her house. She thought it was skinwalkers using their witchcraft on her, but she couldn't explain what was going on. In the back of my mind, I was thinking she was being visited by aliens. She's never talked like this before, and how can she accurately describe an alien gray? She said that they were very small gray, and had a large head. She's had no interaction with the outside world, nor does she have any idea what an alien is. A week went by, and we were concerned for her, and went back for the following weekend. She said that the little children visited her again. This time, she said, she just covered her head with a blanket, and lay quietly in bed. She said that they were in her room digging around. When they were by her bed, she coughed and they left the room and continued to dig around in the kitchen. They dug around, and then they left. I don't know why they were visiting her, and what they were looking for. After mentioning these incidents to the rest of the family, it was decided to take her to a senior care home. She never talked about her visitors again. There are numerous sightings on the reservation. I've also seen strange lights. I wonder what these little children were. This is pretty mild, but it gave me chills when it happened. So I like to explore and fish a lot. They coincide a lot anyway, so it's a pretty big passion of mine. I was hiking along a creek in a rural county near my home, in some dense game lands about 8 or so miles from any house, probably at least double that from a major road or settlement. I had hiked for a while, and was seeing hardly any sign of human presence. Nearly every place I go in my state I can find garbage, hunting trash, or any other sign that people have been there. If I see nothing, it is sort of a good sign that the area is undisturbed. As I was hiking I heard gunshots far away, not uncommon either but the forest was weirdly quiet, and yes, cliché incoming, I felt super uneasy, as if there was another someone there. Eventually I found something really strange and I've looked for the picture forever, but can't find it. It was a small metal box, and I was well versed enough to know it was a geocache, out in the open at the base of a tree. Let me remind you, this is several miles through thick woods, and no sign of human habitation or influence. The box was rusty, and looked to have been through a lot. I tried opening it, but a lot of sediment and rust had accumulated, and I got a little give but nothing significant. There was definitely stuff rattling around, so I tried a ton, but nothing would work. I realized that this story is probably boring, and there was probably nothing even in it, but it seemed very strange to find this so far out I knew I had to get it open somehow. I left it as I found it, and put a piece of duct tape on the tree next to it to find it again. I left and went home. I downloaded the geocaching app, but the box wasn't registered anywhere, nor were there really any geocaches along that creek at all, none registered for miles. So either it wasn't a geocache, or maybe just really old. Anyways, the very next day I went back, armed with a crowbar, hammer and pliers. I went back to the exact spot it was, and I knew it was the right spot. The duct tape was balled up on the ground beside the tree, and the box was nowhere to be found. I looked all around and couldn't find it, at which point, several miles from civilization and several more from cell service, I booked it out of there. I realized this isn't that creepy spooky supernatural etc. But this put me on the edge more than anything else I've ever been through. This incident occurred in Texas in the early 2000s. I'm not saying I saw the tooth fairy, but it was the night that I lost my first tooth. I wrote a letter to the tooth fairy and left it on my nightstand and had a glass of water by my bed. I was five years old at the time. I woke up in the middle of the night because I heard the glass of water hit the floor. I opened my eyes and I saw a very small light moving slowly across the room 
probably five feet up in the air. It was golden in color and small. It just looked like a dot of light to me, but I also had terrible vision and didn't have my glasses on. As it neared the doorway to my room, a new doorway opened on the wall to the side of the door, right over the place where a picture of my great-grandmother's embroidery hung. It was like a black rectangle void, but it had red velvet curtains. The light moved slowly toward it, and that's when I noticed the shadows. Silhouettes of animals danced all over my room, following the light in a line, there was a bear, a big cat of some kind. I know there were other shadows, but I can't remember which animals. I looked and my tooth was still on my nightstand, but when I turned my head again, there was a shadow creeping at the end of my bed. It had fins like a shark or a dolphin, but it had two of them. At this point, the light was almost through the doorway, and it seemed like the portal door was closing, but the thing at the end of my bed was getting bigger in size. Being five years old, I did the reasonable thing and hid under the covers, where I fell asleep. The next morning, there was money on the nightstand and a note from the Tooth Fairy, obviously in my mother's handwriting. But the water glass that had woken me had rolled under my nightstand, still on the floor. If it wasn't for the water glass on the floor, I would have thought the whole thing was a dream. The fairy didn't seem interested in me at all, only the shadow at the end of my bed. A small speck of golden light. Why a fairy? Mainly because it happened on the night I lost my first tooth, but the fairy didn't take the tooth. I always thought it was just paying me a visit. I felt calm when I looked at the light, but the shadows scared me. This experience left me obsessed with fairies through the rest of my childhood, but I never had an experience like that afterward. I've read a lot of lore and mythology about fairies, in my opinion they are magical beings that can't be seen, unless they want to. The animal shadows I saw that night haunt my dreams to this day. I don't know if the shadows were fairies, or just hanging with a little gold fairy, but I only got the sense that the one at the end of my bed was evil, not the bear or the big cat. I thought the bear was funny. He was walking on his hind legs and waving his arms like he was dancing. The one at the end of my bed seemed cold and dark. I've told this story before but didn't really get an explanation. My husband and I were hiking in Jasper Park, Canada. We were talking and passing other hikers every 15-20 minutes or so. We got to a part of the trail that reaches the peak, and then slowly starts to move down the side of a foothill, and the trail is on the side of a slope. We hadn't seen anyone in maybe 30 minutes. All of a sudden the entire earth started to shake, and there was a thunderous noise. We both squat down together and looked frantically around, trying to find the source of the noise, but we saw nothing and heard nothing like branches breaking. I thought for sure it was an elk or something, but if there was an animal, it would have been on the trail either ahead of us or behind us. We started to make loud noises, and I started cracking two rocks together. We kept doing this until we saw another couple hikers about 15 minutes later. We asked if they heard or felt anything, and they said no, so we warned them that there may be an animal on the trail ahead. It would be nice to know what it was. When I was younger probably in the 6th grade, I was at one of my dad's fishing camps. This one happened to be a 1987 Dodge Sportsman, rotting in some old logging camp about two hours north of where I live. I always hated going because my dad always day drank there, and had a general lack of regard for safety departing in a 14-foot aluminum fishing boat with a 20-year-old 8-horsepower motor, while you're hammered with your kid and his friend for example. One time when we were there, I can distinctly remember bright, consistent flashes about every three seconds that lit up half the sky on the horizon. I still don't know what it is. I've seen something similar whilst tenting at a local campground. It was so dim that it was hardly noticeable, 
When I saw it up at the fishing camp, it was almost as bright as lightning. At the local campground I assumed it was maybe a lighthouse or something, because the campground wasn't too far inland from Lake Superior, however the fishing camp is nearly a two-hour drive north. I'm going to guess that it had something to do with the nearby Lac des Illes mine, however now that I'm thinking about it, I think I remember the flashes coming from the east. The mine is to the south. I haven't been there in probably three years, and it's been half a dozen since that took place. So that's about all I can remember. I'm going to go look on Google Earth later to see if there's anything east of the camp, or just look for a plausible source of the illumination. Not really unexplainable, but the most scared I've been in the woods. I was riding my bike home from my girlfriend's house, and had to cross through a river area that had just flooded. There were so many glowing things in my bike lights. Ghostly looking branches, metal debris, beady animal eyes. It was in the spring, and a lot of animals were moving around. Every noise was loud, and I had more prickles up my spine than any other time I'd ridden there, or in the dark. Super creepy seeing trees on the ground covered in dried clay, looking like huge bones. It felt so strange to be within half a mile of civilization, yet feeling so trapped in the woods. I was doing a quote geologist in the park, through the National Park Service at Yellowstone back in the early 80s, it was a summer gig. First thing I do when I take a group around the mud pots, geysers or any sort of thermal area, it tell them, in no uncertain terms to A. Stay on the boardwalks B. Don't put anything into the thermal features Don't throw trash, coins or put your hands, feet, etc. into geothermal features 3. Stay on the boardwalks 4. Take only pictures 5. Stay behind any barricade. 6. Leave only footprints. On the boardwalks. Stay on the boardwalks. Although I really didn't have any sort of official powers or legal standing beyond that of your average blue passport holder, I was large biker beard, corn-fed cheesehead large, loud and seriously into geology and preservation of a geologically unique area. Multitudinous times I had to warn people to stay on the boardwalk, don't throw shit into the thermal features, and the rest of the litany, and for the most part, people would conform, adding the usual amount of grumbling and grousing. Until I took an all-French group around on blistering July afternoon. I spoke no French, but most of the tourists spoke some English, and there was one who volunteered to be my paravachic de jury. I began with the official line of don'ts, and these were all loudly translated to French for the whole group to hear. I even called out a few that were chatting among themselves to, listen up. This is for your benefit, ya diggin me Beaumont, and reviewed the list again. Y'all get that? Any questions? Any at all? Nods and mumbles of agreement, about what I receive from any group. So off we go on the latest tour of geothermal wonders and geological splendor. About halfway through, there are always stragglers, so I halt the tour to wait for the dawdlers to catch up with the tour. Behind my back, I hear a commotion and see one of the berets sporting no beards off the boardwalk, what did I say? Wandering closer to the glory pool to get a better picture or some such horseshit. I get the translator and ask him to scream at that idiot to get back here, while three or four others decide it would be best to just go and get him, and no, he was not deaf or hearing impaired. General panic in Detroit moments until they all finally scarper back onto the boardwalk, only to have one tourist tap me on the shoulder, and ask if that person over there in the opposite direction should be out there. There was yet another of the group stalking a deer that wandered in wondering what all the commotion was. Evidently, since he was headed away from the thermal feature, he would be just safe as houses going off to photo the deer. He wasn't. 
the grounds around any thermal area are treacherous as f. The water table shifts on a daily basis due to the differential thermal flux all Yellowstone caldera controls. So what may support you yesterday may be mere millimeters thick today. He broke through the crust and into superheated geothermally heated water and mud, nature's napalm, up to about chest depth. I immediately called for rescue services via radio, told the French crowd to not move and stay put, or be arrested. And I cautiously worked my way over towards him, we've been trained for this sort of stuff and hoped like hell it never happened to try and drag him out. Touch and go. But belly crawling, swearing a blue streak and luck of the Irish prevailed. I got his arm and slowly dragged him screaming like a gaffed calf out onto less vicious terrain. He lived. Although with massive third-degree burns, a hefty fine and his banning from us national parks for life. A well-known researcher mentioned in an older interview the tale of a child who had gotten separated from her parents in Yosemite National Park. When she was found, her story differed greatly from all others. She told her parents a dogman had found her, had laid with her to rest, had given her berries from his paw, and then led her back to her family. This was the first time I heard anything suggesting werewolf-type cryptids in the wild, and since then I just stumble on more and more. This brings to mind an incident between my little sister and me, she was 16 at the time, myself 24. We were on the fairly placid highway through Valley of the Fires outside Carrizozo, New Mexico bound for Ruidoso, New Mexico in 2011. As we rounded one corner, we both looked left in time to see a gray or salt and pepper fur covered very tall very muscular man, with the characteristic dog legs same bends. We screamed and I swerved. We thought instantly that we had seen a goat man, yet there were no horns. Some goats don't have horns so we didn't seem swayed by that detail. He was wearing some clothing in fact, the most notable being baggy denim shorts. I know that sounds ridiculous, believe me. She and I were dumbfounded as to how or why something so wild looking could be wearing clothes. It was late afternoon around 4 pm, and he didn't hurry when we came into view. He sauntered on normally as though he didn't care if he were spotted. He didn't even look at our car despite my erratic driving when we noticed him. I drive by that spot regularly on commutes for the doctor between Albuquerque, New Mexico, and Ruidoso. And though I've never seen him again, there is a small bluff right there with beautiful rocks and a tall stack, that it would have taken three or more human males to lift and stack the way they're situated. I always see it and figure it had to be Mr. Wolfman who did it. Goatman simply makes no sense anymore. New Mexico is infamous for its goatman stories, though so we assumed based on an idea planted by local history. I'm a 43-year-old woman, and have been abducted three times that I can at least remember. It started when I was 12 years old. I was in my bedroom star gazing out of my window in Arlington, Texas at around 11.15 p.m. on November 22, 1992. I saw a light moving in the night sky that moved slowly south. It was not blinking, and was like a hazy ball of white light. It would stop and go frequently and move in one direction, then disappear and reappear going in another direction. I noticed it getting brighter as if it were getting closer to me. All of a sudden it stops and a beam of light comes straight at me. I fall back off of the table I was sitting on, and I can't see anything but white. My eyes were blurred and couldn't see anything but light. I got cold and felt like I was floating. Then I am all of a sudden in the presence of three beings, and I'm lying on a metallic table. The beings were short and skinny with long arms. Their heads were elongated, and their bodies were like a pale human with tinted skin of grey, and had a texture of scales on their body and wrinkles on their face, especially near their eyes. 
Their eyes were slanted and large black shiny eyes. When they blinked, their eyelids were transparent like a reptile, almost clear. They had a small mouth and almost like a frown. I felt as if I was in a trance state. I could move but was too scared to. So I lay there and looked down at the straps holding my arms and legs. It looked like a type of flexible metal, but soft. They poked me with a needle that came down from the ceiling and a monitor was floating around me, and I could see myself on the monitor. Like a floating TV going all around my body. I began to scream and the one being, who I believe was older and possibly male and gender, looked at me and spoke to me through my mind in a robotic-like human voice, and told me I had nothing to worry about. All of a sudden I looked at him and thought what do you want? He responded we are here to help you. We are of many, and we are one of the same. I asked, what do you mean we are the same? He looked at the other two beings, and then the other smaller being said in a female robotic-like voice, we protect your race from others who want to harm you. I kept asking questions, and they began to ignore me. They put a film of clear soft silk-like material over my face, and I don't remember anything after that. I woke up in my bedroom on the floor and wobbled my way to the window, and they were gone. I looked at my clock, and it was 11.34 PM. It had only been 20 minutes or so, but it felt like hours had gone by. Throughout the years I have had multiple abductions, and it's just not something you go telling people without getting a weird look. Back in 2012, I began a blog online and explained many of my experiences. My computer would constantly crash, and even catch fire during a live chat with another person, while chatting about our experiences online. It began to make me nervous to go online researching things like this. I feel as if I'm being watched by our government. Through many of my abductions, I have learned that the government is working hand in hand with them, and it is bigger than I realize. Something is going on which I believe is a new form of genetic transformation of the human species. I thought it was a prank at first, just a belated April Fool's joke from one of my buddies. I never thought for a second that it could have spiraled into the horrifying mess I found myself in. The thick stone ceiling above me has made calling the cops impossible, but I think I have just enough signal to get this out to the internet, my note in a bottle if you will. There are no clocks here, but as far as I can tell, this all started a few hours ago. I sat hunched over my computer desk, squinting at the harsh blue light of my monitor. I was going through my nightly ritual of scanning through Craigslist for any good deals. I was moments away from powering the computer down and giving my tired brain a break when I saw it. The image was so surreal, it took me a moment to figure out what I was looking at. There, Nestled between a vintage typewriter and a dusty old sofa, was a picture of me. The title was my full name, and the price was listed at $1D500. I mentally went through all of my friends and family, trying to figure out who would do something like this, but came up empty-handed. I saw there were more pictures and went to scroll through them, but hesitated, I was afraid that I'd be met with fuzzy Polaroids of me taken from behind bushes and through windows. However, as I scrolled through the images, I realized I recognized each one. I'd taken them. They were all from my Facebook feed. A selfie I'd taken with some friends at a bar. A picture of me at the beach with my girlfriend. I felt my heart rate begin to quicken. My Facebook was set to private and I never friended anyone I didn't know. How had these pictures gotten onto the internet? I clicked the listing and began anxiously reading the description. Product is a 26-year-old Caucasian male. It is 237 pounds and 5 foot 8. It consumes approximately 2, 200 calories per day. I raised an eyebrow at that last line. What would anyone want with that information? It went on to describe everything I'd eaten for the past two weeks in meticulous detail. 
Everything from the McGriddle I'd had on my way to work, to the Snickers I'd munched on today after dinner. They even knew about my ad medication. I nervously glanced around my house, suddenly feeling naked and vulnerable. Where were they getting this information? How long had they been keeping tabs on me? Just when I thought it couldn't get any worse, I saw a short message at the end of the post that made my skin crawl. Product is unathletic, and should be easily collected by two three people. Bringing weapons are suggested, but not needed. Collected. Any hope of this being a joke was beginning to evaporate. How many people had seen the listing by now? What kinds of people go searching for a listing like this at all? Then I had a thought that made me bring a hand to my mouth. Did this page have my address listed? It seemed terrifyingly possible. The listing had seemingly every other detail about me, why not that? My eyes scanned the web page until I found a message that explained everything. Address for $1,500. Email me if interested. It made a sick sort of sense. They'd found a way to monetize their stalking. Why let such great talent go to waste, right? I wondered how many other people he'd done this to. How many home invasions and robberies and abductions he'd helped facilitate just for a few thousand bucks. I immediately flagged the post, hoping to have it taken down. However, I quickly realized it would take hours, maybe even days for the moderators at Craigslist to get to it. I didn't have that time to spare. My fingers flew across the keyboard, searching Google for some way to get a hold of the people at Craigslist, but in the end, all I could find was a generic contact form. Getting desperate, I opened my email to try one last gambit. I plugged in the seller's address, a random string of numbers and letters, and typed out a desperate plea to take down the listing, offering five times the original price. Waiting for a response was torture. I passed the time by running around my house, locking all of the doors and windows. I also turned out all of the lights to make it look like no one was home. I knew realistically, the odds of some psycho seeing the post was slim. But the internet was a big place, and I didn't want to take any chances. I was so on edge that by the time I heard the ding of the email notification, my heart practically jumped out of my chest. I regret to inform you that the information has already been purchased. I buried my head in my hands. I had been too late. How long ago had it been bought? 10 minutes ago, an hour, a day. My line of thought was broken when the crackle of wheels on gravel brought my attention to the window. I pulled the curtains aside and peered out into the night, careful to reveal as little of myself as possible. A black SUV was pulling into my driveway, its occupants hidden behind a dark window. I told myself everything was fine, that they were just doing a three-point turn, and would be gone any minute. However, instead of driving away, the doors popped open in unison. Two figures emerged from the car, dressed head to toe in black. I wanted to turn and run but fear had paralyzed me. I watched helplessly as the men marched up to the front door and knocked loudly. I realized then that their plan must have been to wait for me to answer the door and drag me into their car, but I knew better. I began calling 911, cursing myself for not doing it sooner. The door was heavy oak, and would take them at least a minute or two to kick down. That's when I heard it. There was a strange beeping sound coming from the other side of the door. After racking my brain for a few moments, I figured out what it was. It was the beeping of my door's keypad. They couldn't possibly know the code, could they? Then it dawned on me. The creep who'd posted the listing knew everything about me. Of course, they knew the passcode. My blood ran cold and I dashed away from the door, looking for a place to hide. Click. The door unlocked. I ducked behind a corner into the kitchen, just as it began to slowly creak open. The back door was at the other side of the kitchen, and I began creeping toward it, grateful I'd turned the lights out earlier. 
The two men cautiously stepped into the living room, talking in hushed voices about where I might be. I had almost made it to the back door when I bumped into the kitchen table. I cursed myself for not seeing it. Their whispers immediately stopped, and they began marching toward me, forcing me to improvise a hiding place. I slipped into my kitchen's pantry and shut the door just as the light clicked on. The men, apparently no longer concerned with stealth, began stomping around the kitchen, looking for me. I squeezed my eyes shut and prayed they didn't look inside, knowing I'd be completely helpless if they did. I bit down on my knuckles and time seemed to stretch out forever. But they eventually left, going deeper into the house to search for me. I let out a sigh of relief. Buzz. My phone was ringing in my pocket. I took it out, and it was my girlfriend, Lexi. My eyes widened. Lexi. She'd be home any minute. What if the men decided to take her instead? I answered the call. Hey you, she said. Lexi, don't come to the house, it's not safe. Oh my god, where are you, she asked, fear creeping into her voice. I'm hiding in the pantry, I think I'm safe for now but... The line went dead. I felt my heart sink. Had they gotten to her already? Had I not warned her in time, then I heard something strange vibrating noise in the room over. One of the men's phone was ringing. He answered it and listened a moment. His voice was raspy and muffled. He's where? Another pause. Then footsteps, thundering straight toward me. My mind raced momentarily, and then it hit me. The one who had posted the listing hadn't been stalking me. They had been living with me. Lexi was the one who'd posted it. And she just told them exactly where I was. I burst out of the pantry and made a break for the door, just as the two men rounded the corner behind me. I wanted to look back, but fought the urge. If I looked back I'd get nervous, and if I got nervous I'd stumble, and if I stumbled they'd drag me into their car, and do God knows what. I flung open the back door and ran into the cool damp air. However, before I could make a break for it, one of them caught me by the hood, snapping my neck back. The fabric tightened around my throat like a snake, making it hard to breathe. I blindly threw an elbow behind me, and it connected with his ribs. The man cried out in pain, and I felt his grip loosened by just a fraction. A fraction was all I needed. I tucked in my chin, drew in my arms, and wriggled out of the hoodie, falling to the wet earth on hands and knees. I made a mad dash for the tree line. As I ran I heard angry shouts from behind me. Just shoot. The damn thing is jammed. Oh give me that. A loud pop rang out in the night, and something whizzed past my ear. I wondered what they'd shot at me. The sound was too quiet to be a gun. A quick glance behind me revealed one of the men was holding what looked like a small, lightweight sniper rifle. It was green with a strange white chamber at the bottom. What the hell is that thing? The man shoved something inside, clicked it back, and took aim. Pop. Fear shot through me like a bolt of electricity. I jerked my body out of the way just in time for something to fly past me and bury itself in a nearby tree. It was a dart. They were shooting at me with a tranquilizer gun, like I was a wild animal. The tree line was about 40 feet away now. My lungs felt like they were full of bees, but I kept running anyway, knowing if I slowed even a fraction they'd catch me. I did my best to avoid the darts, diving out of the way whenever I heard one of those sickening pops, but eventually, my luck ran out. Just as I reached the tree line, ready to disappear behind the dense foliage, I felt a red-hot sting in my back. Exhaustion began flooding my body, making my movements slow and sluggish. The world spun around me and soon, I found myself on the forest floor. My memories of what happened next are jagged and frayed. The click of a truck, the jangle of chains. When I finally came to my senses I found myself on a damp, concrete floor, 
bathed in darkness, shivering from the biting cold. The only noise breaking the eerie silence were the heavy thuds of footsteps over my head. They left me my phone, maybe to keep me from going crazy, maybe to taunt me. To ensure I can't ask for help, they've somehow blocked all posting or messaging features. At least, almost all of them. Nosleep is the only place that I can post. At first, I thought they'd made a mistake. I thought maybe this subreddit had just slipped past them. But now I'm starting to realize it's because they think no one will believe me. But that can't be true. At least one of you has to believe me, right? Story time. This happened back in the mid 80s. My friends and I, four and all, used to go hiking in the Cascades and Oregon quite a bit. While 99% of the hikers stick to the trails, we'd plan trips off the beaten path to discover areas few people had ever seen. We'd plan a trip, take a trail up to the general area, and then strike out towards a place we wanted to check out, sometimes a day or two out depending on how rough the terrain was. Our last trip started out normally enough. We'd made it to our launch point, spent the night, had breakfast the following day, and had broken out our Forest Service topographical maps to make our plans. This time around we hadn't decided on a destination, and were considering our options. That's the last thing we remember for nearly 24 hours. We woke up the next day, still in our clothes from the previous day, in our tents. We didn't even know a day had passed until one of my friends checked his watch and noticed that the date wasn't right, which I confirmed with my own watch yes, even back then there were watches that kept the date. One moment we were looking over maps to see where we wanted to go, the next we woke up in our tents, all of us feeling like we were hungover. The thing is, while my friends swore they didn't remember anything, I did, if only a little. What I remember is that we were doing some hard hiking in the mountains when we heard children's voices, the sort of noise you hear at a playground. All of us were, what the effing, thinking that we'd really screwed up in our navigational skills in a way that boggled the mind, and we headed towards the noise to see just how the hell we'd gotten so far off track, and where on God's green earth we actually were. We broke out of the tree line into a clear area, where there were a number of low, squat buildings, the sort that remind you of what the US. Army builds spare, utilitarian, ugly, green. Surrounding the buildings I assume all the way around, but I don't know was a heavy duty chain link fence, not the normal sort, but the industrial strength kind. Towards where we were was a large blacktop, where children were running around, and where a mixed group of kids and adults were also playing a game of basketball. It was, indeed, a playground of sorts, inside of what looked like a military compound. Out in the middle of nowhere, deep in the mountains, and not on any map. I remember one of the adults looking up, then everything gradually falling silent, as the entire group of adults and kids eventually noticed the four dumbstruck hikers on the other side of the fence and then nothing. That's it until I woke up in one of our two tents, the next day. As I said, my friends said they remembered nothing, and all they wanted to do after they realized they lost a day was get the F out of the mountains and back home. Me, I remembered, at least a little, and I was pissed because I figured we had stumbled onto something secret, and had been drugged and dumped back at our campsite for our efforts. I wanted to figure out where the hell we'd been hiking, go back, and see what there was to see, but the guys were having none of it. I tried a number of times to see if I could get any of the gang to go back up with me, this time with cameras, and try to figure out where we decided to hike, but the guys flat out refused any discussion of the matter, much less an actual attempt. Going by yourself into wild country is outright stupid, and I wasn't quite so pissed as to consider this a valid option, so I never went on my own. To this day I have no idea what it is that we found, or why someone thought it necessary to drug us and dump us. I figured we weren't killed outright because four missing, 
experienced hikers would result in a newsworthy search and rescue op, especially since one of us was sort of famous, and just might make national news if they up and disappeared. I'm still pissed about it though, and would seriously like to dish out some payback to the shit stains who messed with us. Some friends and I went camping to scout some private land owned by a family of a friend in Tennessee. We camped right on some four-wheeling track, but clearly the property hadn't been touched in a very long time. The second day we dropped some molecules and went exploring deep in these woods. Beyond the insane amount of ticks, the hike was actually very nice. Until. We got about a mile and a half deeper in. We walked along some bare-faced rock ledges that ran along a creek. After taking a route along the creek, we stumbled into a cleared-out area in the middle of the woods. The space was the first thing I noticed. It felt like it was intentionally carved out by people residing in the woods, or coming here on a regular basis. But it got weirder. We started discovering all sorts of remnants of past visitors. We looked a little deeper, and found a cast iron oven, and a couch rotting from exposure, and riddled with bullet holes. Near the couch was a road sign. A large one. The original size was probably a solid 6x8. If you've ever handled one of these road signs, you'll understand that they are not light. It would take a lot of effort to drag that out to the middle of nowhere in the woods. Now, if it was just a sign, this story would be going nowhere, but it wasn't just a road sign. The sign had been carved into the shape of a full woman, from head to toe. The rendition was completely accurate showing lots of patience and skill. But this wasn't a piece of art. Throughout the entire body and face of this metal woman's body, were holes made by both bullets, and what apparently was either an extremely large knife of an axe. Once we saw this, we got right the F out of there. This must have been around 1992. I was camping and hiking with a friend in the Lake District, and we were making our way through Borrowdale along the Derwent. It's a popular spot of the country, there's always plenty of tourists out and about. I was following my friend, and we rounded a large boulder by the river, and he stopped. We did that comedy thing of me not paying attention and bumping into him. He indicates to me to shush, and I poke my head around to see what made him stop. Stood in the middle of the river was a quote self-pleasuring man, shirt pulled up and tucked under his chin, trousers nowhere to be seen. We sniggered, shook our heads, and took a different route. He didn't see us. We ambled and dawdled further along the route, and after a snack stop, we could hear what sounded like girls squealing. We decided to investigate, and who did we see, but the creep once again with trousers around his ankles this time. Only this time he's flashing at girls on the other side of the river. Gripped by an adolescent sense of justice, we decided something must be done, but being a pair of fairly weedy nerds, we thought getting the police would be better. It was agreed my friend would jog up to the nearest road to flag down someone to call the police, and I'd remain behind to keep an eye on Mr. Wavy Penis. I skulked unseen behind a tree and kept watch. After a couple of minutes something must have unnerved the wanker, I'm assuming an infuriated parent starting to wade across the river, or something as he left the riverbank and headed straight through the woods towards where I was hiding. I was sitting in a hollow in the roots of a tree. He walked straight past me and turned to look behind him. He was only feet away. I stopped breathing. He stared through the trees for what felt like an eternity. I thought I was doomed. Then he just turned away and headed back up to the road. I followed him to the road and figured out he was headed for the nearest car park. My friend had gone that way to find someone to call the police, so we met up as he was coming back to find me, and we were able to get the registration of the van that Flashman had got into. Within a minute of him driving off, a police car arrived giving the full blues lights and squealing tires. We waved them down, 
and they were there to respond to the call my friend had convinced someone to make to 999 for us. We gave a brief description, and the van details. The police were delighted as this guy had been doing this for years, but people would see him and run off to call the police how did we ever cope before mobiles, and he'd have disappeared by the time they arrived. We arranged to make fuller statements at the station and started to drive back. Luckily we were parked in the same car park, and the police would follow us back to Keswick. About halfway back along the valley I checked the rearview mirror, and saw the police car slam on the brakes and throw on the lights. They disappeared down a track off the road. When we got to the station to make our statements, we were pulled into a side room and told to be quiet. The policeman told us they had spotted the van as we were driving back and had gone looking for him. They had found the flasher with his shirt off and flies undone prowling through the woods. Unfortunately, there were no available cells in the station's small town, so he was being held in one of the offices next to where we were. Arrangements were made to return to take part in an identity parade, and to point out our man. When we did return later the police told us he had now refused to take part in an ID parade, so we were asked whether we would be prepared to be taken into the room he was being held in look him in the eye and confirm it was the flasher. We agreed F it, it's not like we had to live there and confirm that was the guy. Full statements were given, justice was done, and we would eventually receive a lovely letter from the Cumbrian top cop thanking us for our efforts. As we left the station feeling rather exhilarated after our small adventure, Mr. Wagelnob's wife we assumed arrived. Before the doors closed fully behind us, we could hear her shouting, You dirty F, you've been doing it again, haven't you? Hiking to one of my favorite spots in the Appalachian Mountains, I came across what appeared to be a recently built stone altar, with a large wooden cross situated behind it. There was a string tied to the cross that went directly over the altar, and tied to a tree across the way. Several other strings tied to trees all of which had markings freshly carved into them. There was a pentagram of rocks in the middle of all of it. There's been lots of rumors throughout the years of satanic cults, worshipping in the woods of this area. This was my first experience with it. My name is Brandon, and I live in Alabama. I'm about 14, and this story takes place in the year 2008 or 2009. I'm not really sure, I was quite young. At the time, I lived with my grandmother and grandfather, which I'm not going to say exactly why. So, we were beginning to move and doing things to renovate the yard, putting grass around the house. We had a few people helping my grandfather and grandmother, while my brother and I played around in the street and ran the house. Since it was not a very big house, but big enough for us to have a deck on it in the back, there is a small patch of woods just behind the house. So, my brother and I were just playing, and I don't know, I just felt like something was off around the woods behind us, like something was there, keeping an eye on us, watching us. I would hear sounds of leaves and branches moving. Maybe it was the wind, maybe not. Maybe 40 or 50 minutes later, we were pretty hungry and thirsty, so we ate and later went back to play. When we got back, we went to play, and about 10 minutes had passed. I totally forgot about the woods, and the sounds I had heard stopped. I stopped and just looked to see if I could see something, and I walked over there, not really close but close enough, and still nothing. It's like whatever was in there just stopped. So, I didn't want to think about it even more because I got paranoid easily and left and didn't go back over behind the house. The next day, there was only a little grass left to cover the house, and the sun was setting. I didn't remember to avoid the back of the house unless necessary. I was playing, walked behind and stood. I had a feeling something else was there with me. 
I turned to my right and saw this big animal, or something like a werewolf, or some sort of upright dog with yellow eyes looking at me, lying on the ground. I stood there for a few seconds, and then ran to the front of the house, telling my grandparents what I just saw. Well, neither of them believed me and told me to keep playing. So, for the rest of the time, I just sat at the front of the house, thinking that's what it was. I still don't know what it was, or if it was there at all. And before I moved there, I swear I heard things outside in the woods, and sometimes I've seen things. Things first started really taking off around 2010. See, my best friend lives on the outskirts of a small nearby community, which is only about 10 miles away as the crow flies. There's a lot of heavy brush and forestation. It's all primarily secluded private property. The nearest neighbor is roughly one fourth mile away in both directions. One night, my best friend's girlfriend had just left his house from spending the evening with him. They were having a picnic outside in his front yard together. When he had thrown an apple out in his front yard, he had taken one bite, tasted that it was too sour for him, and threw it. The next morning came, and he was outside his yard doing some cleaning up. When he went to find the apple that he accidentally left, he noticed it was gone. He didn't put a lot of thought into it. He just thought an animal had taken it after all. It was just one apple he threw, figuring animals would come and eat it anyway. About a week later, he came home from work to find a dead fox on his porch. It looked like it had been strangled to death. Its eyes were literally popping out of its skull. He said the kill was fresh and wasn't sure if somebody was just trying to mess with him or what. Then he looked next to the fox, and the same now rotting apple with one bite taken out of it was sitting right next to the dead fox. He began freaking out and was pretty sure that somebody was screwing with his head. He didn't call anyone though, instead, he waited to see if anything else would happen. Time went on, and nothing else happened. These events that I just told you about happened in September before it started to get chilly. So, fast forward about six to nine months to the following spring, just as it was getting warm again. One evening, as he was having his girlfriend over for dinner in his house, his girlfriend started screaming that there was a huge, hairy man in the front lawn. He flew out and opened his door. There, standing about 50 feet away in the front yard, was this big black mass, as he described it. It was just standing there. His eyes tried to focus on it in the twilight of the evening, but his eyes pulled him to the object that this thing seemed to be holding in its hand. It looked to be a dead raccoon, a rather large one. He couldn't make out a face, definitive features, or anything else that would be specific to its description but he said that he felt like it was staring right at him. This thing quickly darted behind a nearby tree, once it realized he was looking at it. He said this creature seemed to be about 5 to 6 feet tall, if he had to guess, was really bulky and very shaggy and hairy. He knew instinctively that what he had seen outside of his house was a Sasquatch. Over the next couple of days, he thought more and more about it and believed this creature was the thing that had left the dead fox on his porch along with the apple with one bite taken out of it the previous fall. He hasn't experienced any other activity around his house, or anything like that since initially sighting this in his front yard. Lots of kooky American hiking stories. Geez you guys have some weirdos in the woods. This one's slightly different and Australian. Hiking in the north of Australia, where there is a very strong Aboriginal presence, historically rock art and remnants and modern day, so can't disclose exact location. Let's just say it was in the top end of the Northern Territory. Bit of background, I was on a 22-day remote hike, one supply drop, no roads, no trails and very difficult terrain. Waterfalls, rainforest, savanna and treacherous sandstone country. On around day 18 I was heading up a creek, and it had been raining all afternoon, so the creek was rapidly swelling. 
At this point we were probably 150 kilometers to the nearest dirt road, much further than that to a settlement. The kind of country you really know very few white feet have ever trodden on, really humbling. Made camp on a nice sandy beach sandstone remember, and then went for a swim and a scout around camp, mainly to see what rock art was in the area. I head up past my immediate waterfall swimming hole, and find a beautiful pool with a waterfall tumbling off a low undercut sandstone slab. Naturally I swam across to climb under the slab and get behind the waterfall. The crevice under the slab is perhaps one meter high, just high enough to scramble and sit under. Water flows underneath as well, but mainly over the top of the slab and in front of me. I'm lying back with a friend looking out onto the pool and water cascade when I notice something on the ceiling. It's rock art, under a waterfall with flowing water. Now this is quite unusual as people never really painted in places like this as one. It's a spooky cave in two. It's under a waterfall in an area that experiences that gets massive floods and likely to be damaged easily. Its location immediately makes me think it's something strange. And as I digest the artwork in front of me that increases. I'm looking at two odd skeletal things, long bony fingers, rib cages visible with outlines around them, each around one meter in diameter. I'm thinking there's something to do with sorcery or black magic art, and am being suitably creeped the f out, when it dawns on me what they probably are. These little bony figures are babies, the outline surrounding them is the amniotic sac. I'm looking at ancient paintings of dead babies or stillborns, under a waterfall, in the unbelievably remote and spooky wilderness. I decide to quickly side with custom, and get the F away from the obvious women's place, but not before I confirm by having quick look nearby. Indeed, to the side of the waterfall, in a more traditional place for rock art, I find birthing painting. Adult women and healthy children painted. I do have pictures of all this, but unfortunately I can't possibly post them due to cultural reasons sorry. I know that will piss some people off, but if you were from here you'd know how big a deal it is, and opens me up to all kinds of yucky legal stuff. I was mountain biking with my dad and a bunch of his friends and we came to the last long downhill of the ride. I always let them go first, because I am way faster. They go down, and I wait for 5 minutes, then go for it. I get 200 yards from the end of the trail, and they are all on one side of the trail stopped in a line. At this point, there is no way I can stop fast enough, so I just get ready to jump anything in the way of the trail. My dad freaks the F out telling me to stop, stop stop as soon as i get within 20 feet i see probably 30 big ass rattlesnakes crossing the trail i immediately pull up as hard as i can and bunny hop about 10 feet over all of them then i stopped came back and checked out the snakes along with my dad's blood pressure made sure he was okay then finished the ride i'm telling you sickest bunny hop ever When I was 12, I contracted hepatitis A. I was really ill, and for a month didn't say anything to anyone. I mean I was just a kid. Well, it progressed, and by the time they caught it, I was close to death. I was all yellow, my eyes, skin, everything, and in severe pain. I was admitted to the hospital. I didn't have parents. My sister had guardianship of me. She like dropped me off and I never saw her again. I was hospitalized for a month or more. I was on pain medications. My liver was inflamed, and it was impossible to eat. One night I awoke because I felt a presence. At the foot of my hospital bed were two little reptilian men. They were about four feet tall. Needless to say, I jumped out of my hospital bed, and tore out my ebbs, making the alarms go off at the nurse's desk. I crawled under my bed the nurses had to coax me out. Think of it, a 12-year-old child awakening to see lizard men in their room. 
As fast as it occurred they were just gone. I've not spoken of this in years. I only told two other people in my life. There was another time in about 2006 or 27. My husband fell asleep on the couch. So I left him and went upstairs to bed. Mind you, my room was dark. Really dark. I said my prayers and went to sleep. Sometime during the night, I awoke to this thing sitting on top of me. I started to wrestle with this thing, and let me tell you it was darker than my room. It was not sleep paralysis. I was awake. This thing was tangible. I could feel it. All of a sudden it was just gone, as the green lizard men. I jumped up and grabbed a cross I had hanging on my wall, laid back down prayed, and fell back to sleep. I don't care if people believe these things happened in fact, I've had lots of experiences with weird things. I've only been scared two times, the time the lizard men were in my room, and another when I awoke and felt a presence in our home, was turned facing the wall. And in my heart, I knew if I turned to look there was going to be something or someone there. Ignoring it, I fell back asleep. I am writing about a sighting I had on June 26, 2011, around 8 p.m. at Nelson Lake, Wisconsin. I was fishing from my canoe about 30 yards from the shore near Tanning Point when I noticed a whimpering sound. It was coming from the woods at the shoreline. It sounded like a dog whining, so I stopped what I was doing to watch the woods to see if anything appeared. After a few seconds, I saw a child scampering from the woods. I didn't get a very good look, but the child had very thick brown hair all over its body, and was very small human toddler size. It quickly showed itself, and then bolted back towards the woods. I sat there in shock. But within seconds I heard three distinct and angry grunts. I then saw a large ape-like head rise above the lower tree boughs. The eyes were barely visible, but I could tell that it didn't want me there. That was enough for me so I started to paddle towards the north shore when all of a sudden I heard a loud plop, and then splash from behind the boat. I turned around in time to see another rock heading in my direction. It was many yards from me but I got the message. I was shaking from the time I witnessed these beasts up until a few hours later, when I was in my home office pondering what I had seen. I think it may have been Bigfoot. I googled Wisconsin Bigfoot and your blog came up. Was this a Bigfoot? I'm not an outdoorsman though I enjoy canoeing and fishing. Have there been other sightings in this area? Is there a danger? I appreciate your help. I am a state employee so I would prefer my identity remain confidential. Thank you. L. The following incident was in the same area. According to the Sawyer County Sheriff's Department, two deputies responded to an alleged Bigfoot, or Sasquatch, sighting on Highway 63 just south of Sealy on the evening of Jan. 3. Since then the sighting has been the topic of conversation in that small community with multiple reported sightings being called into the Sawyer County Record Office since. Chief Deputy Tim Zeigel confirmed that two deputies responded to the call, only to find footprints and hair at the site. But, unless Bigfoot was wearing boots, Zeigel laughed, I think it's pretty much a prank. A lady called in and said, you probably think I'm nuts, but I'm not. I have not been drinking. She reported seeing a Bigfoot or someone dressed in an ape suit on Highway 63 near Stark Road, Zeigel said. We sent a couple officers up there, and what they found was a set of foot tracks going from the road to the timberline and back to the road, and they also found a long, black hair. He affirmed that there have been no sightings since then. But the story takes a curious turn from there. According to another reported sighting obtained by the record, a Wausau man, who wishes to remain unnamed, and his nephew were snowmobiling on a trail just southwest of Sealy, when they saw something unusual cross the trail. I don't know what I saw, but my nephew and I both saw something very real, he said. 
We only saw legs from the hips down as it was caught in the headlights of our snowmobiles. It stepped out of the woods, walking upright, and stepped across the trail right in front of my nephew, who was ahead of me 20-30 feet. The legs were long and covered with long dark hair, he continued. My first thought was it was a drunk walking through the woods after leaving the sawmill saloon, but that makes no sense. We were quite a ways west of the sawmill, and there is no trail or crossing anywhere near there for someone to be walking. After gunning their snowmobiles past, the two turned around to explore the area and find tracks. But they had not marked the spot with a landmark, and were unsuccessful at finding any sign when they returned to the area. We saw these legs for only a very brief moment, but again, it was very real, he added. Following up on the sighting, several possible theories have been revealed. Cindy Ferrero of the Sawmill Saloon said that one potential explanation is that something was roused when the managed portion of the Urenhold Memorial Forest south of Highway who was cleaned up a few months ago. She said a friend who lives in the Seely Hills area has reported unusual behavior coming from her dogs lately. They seem to be agitated by something out of the ordinary. Back in 2013, I was bear hunting in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. We were in Ontonagon County, northwest of Bruce's Crossing, my hunting stand was just north of FR 730 about 3 miles from US 45. The trail I was on was evenly spaced between FR 735 and FR 736. It was a small creek called Scranton Creek. It was almost dry at the time. I took the trail north about 2 miles and found a good place to set up a ground blind. I was hunting with a handgun, a 500 Smith & Wesson with a factory red dot scope on it. I've hunted all my life with handguns and have bagged deer and tons of small game. I'm also an NR a certified instructor, and at the time was shooting competitively and teaching classes for concealed pistol licenses. I felt that I needed to give you some background on myself. I was totally confident in my ability to keep myself safe in the woods. I took up my stand just before daylight on the opening day of the first bear hunt. About an hour after the first light, I heard what I can only describe as a wood knock. It was north of me towards the Victoria Dam area. There was a series of knocks. First I heard three knocks evenly spaced, and then two knocks that sounded closer to me. About 15 minutes later again, I heard three knocks that sounded like they came from the spot that I heard the two response knocks from, and again, I heard another two knocks. They were again closer to me. I thought to myself what the hell is making those knocking sounds. Again, about 15 minutes later, I heard three knocks from where the two responses had come from, and then right behind me was a fast four to five knocks, and everything in the woods went quiet. It was so quiet I could hear the bugs flying around. I sat there wondering what the hell was going on, and who or what knew that I was there. I was in a camo pop-up blind, and I knew that whatever knew I was there had not seen me. About 15 minutes later I heard a whirling sound approaching me and a crash next to the blind. I got up went out and found a tree branch about 3 feet long and 3 or 4 inches in diameter had landed about a foot away from my blind. Now when I set up the blind I was cautious to make sure there were no trees with branches that could fall on me. There was a clear path through the trees to the trail about 6 feet wide, but it was a good 100 feet from my blind of the trail. No man that I know of could have thrown that piece of wood that far and with the speed it had flown. I radioed my hunting partner, and told him to come to my blind as soon as possible. When he got there I told him what had happened, and we both agreed that I should let whatever wanted the area have it, so we packed everything out and I went to another stand. I had set up on FR 733 where the North Country Trail crossed it. I ended up taking a 400 plus pound male bear the next day. It weighed 389 pounds dressed at the way station at Bruce's Crossing. 
I always wonder what threw that tree branch, and did all the wood knocking. The week I got back home, I was watching the BFRO guys on TV, and found out that they were about 40 miles south of where I was hunting looking for a Bigfoot, that the natives up there had reported to them, so I contacted them and told them my story, and was blown off by Cliff Berrickman. I felt that I had something to share, and they just weren't interested. The next year 2014, I took my girlfriend up there with me to show her around, and as we were coming back home, we were somewhere between Watersmeet and Iron River on US-2. As we drove past a blueberry bog that was on the north side of the road, at least a good 200 acres, we both saw a hair-covered animal stand up in the middle of the bog. It was at least 4 feet taller than the brush, and the brush was 4 feet tall or more itself. I looked at her and all she said was, keep going, I've hunted up there many times since, and have not had any more things happen, but sometimes you feel like you're being watched. My older brother and I were walking down the street, returning home from our grandmother's house in the dark. This was in Laporte, Texas. There was a large, grassy lot next to our house, where our uncle lived in a mobile home at the back. It was a clear night and my brother was teaching me some of the constellations as we walked. We saw a gold-colored light come from the south and hover over us. I thought it was an airplane at first, but as it got closer, I realized it wasn't making any noise. I remember being afraid but my brother was excited. He said, oh wow, they are real. I grabbed his arm and tried to pull him to the house, panicking. He laughed and told me to calm down, that they wouldn't hurt us. He was my older brother so I trusted him to protect me. I stood behind him as the light came to the ground and landed in front of my uncle's house. It was a large black pyramid shape that was missing the top point. It had a couple of windows on the side, about halfway up. After it stopped moving, a slot opened up on the side facing us. The light that was under the craft was a greenish blue, and it hovered off the ground a foot or two, as the slot opened, and a beam came out. I guess unfolded out would be more accurate. The being looked almost human with a large, odd-shaped head, almond eyes the color of absolute darkness, and a small slit below where the nose slits were. It was very tall compared to my brother. He was about 14 years old so probably five and a half feet. The being was maybe six or seven feet. When it exited the craft, I heard a noise, like a soft murmuring of a bunch of voices. I was immediately soothed. I felt sleepy suddenly, but then the entity took my hand and my brother's hand. I don't remember it walking to us, but I remember how cold its hand was, and how rubbery it felt. I felt like I was floating, and it was taking us to its ship. We went inside and the slot closed behind us. Inside, it took us to a room where my brother was taken by another being, and I was led to a table. I screamed for my brother, but the being picked me up and sat me on the table, placed his fingers on my eyes, and I couldn't move or talk anymore. I was laid on the table, and my clothes were taken off. I remember there being a soft pink light and three beings in the room with me. There was a straw-like tool hanging above me that one being put against my belly button. I remember searing pain below my belly button and smelling hot metal like copper. I tried to scream, but then the pain was gone. I looked toward one of the beings and saw my brother on the table near mine. He was looking at me with tears in his eyes. I could hear his voice, but his lips weren't moving. He told me he was sorry, he was wrong, and that he loved me. I felt warm whereas before I was so cold. The being stopped moving as my brother, and I talked without moving our lips. I would think about him, and then hear his voice responding to me. We'd never been able to do that before. After a few minutes, my brother looked away from me, and I felt him slip away, mentally, and then he screamed like he was being murdered. I thought they were killing him, 
but I couldn't see anything because one of the beings moved between us and started looking in my ears with a bright light. I remember the gray color of those three fingered hands, the way they seemed to me to be rubber straws, the tips against my skin feeling terribly similar to a frog's flesh. They pried open my eyes when I tried to scrunch them shut and put a jelly substance in them. Then they stuck something up in my nose that hurt so bad I passed out. When I woke up, the ship was gone. My brother was lying in the ditch a few feet from me, and I thought he was dead. I heard my mother calling for me and my brother, so I sat up and called back to her. She ran to me from our yard to where my brother was lying, and when she saw him, she screamed. She picked him up and grabbed my hand, carrying him into the house. She asked me what happened as she laid him on the couch, but as I started to answer, my nose started bleeding. My brother came to as my mother wiped a cold rag over his face, and I got a washcloth for my nose. She kept asking why we were out till 3 in the morning. My brother told her about the craft and I did too, but she said she thought we were trying to make stuff up. She said it was obvious someone had beaten us up. We saw how bad our story upset her so we agreed, it was the local bully that beat us both up. After my mother went to bed when she thought we were asleep, my brother came into my room, and we talked about it, agreeing to not talk about it again. The next day, he and I went to my uncle's yard. We looked for signs that something had been there, and we saw a square portion of the grass had been pressed down like a heavy weight had been on top of it. It's been 38 years now and only recently have my brother and I spoken of the incident. I still remember it like it was yesterday and so does he. This happened when I was 22 female, I'm now in my 30s. At the time, I was preparing applications for grad school, so after work each evening, I would go to the local university library and stay until closing, which was 11 pm. I took the subway to my neighborhood and decided to make a quick stop at the nearby 24-hour grocery store to get some things for a late-night dinner. I bought my items and was back outside waiting at the crosswalk for the light to change so I could cross the street. There were at least two other people waiting at the crosswalk as well. I lived in a major metropolis, and so there were almost always other people around at whatever time of night or day. Suddenly, a man comes running from out of nowhere, it seemed and stands next to me, now also waiting at the crosswalk. He was middle-aged, about 5 foot 7 170 centimeters, and had a slim build. I thought that maybe he just wanted to make sure he would make the light, and not miss the chance to cross. However, as we are crossing the street I notice that he starts to make some odd movements with his legs. I don't really know how to describe it other than to say he was kind of tripping himself up and drastically slowing down, so that he went from walking in front of me to suddenly being directly behind me. To be honest, my first thought at the time was racism. I have a very petite and feminine build, looked very young, and was clutching library books in my arms, but I am also a black woman. I truly thought that he was scared to have me walk behind him. It never even entered my mind that I might be the one in danger. I simply noted his behavior, laughed it off, and then forgot about him. On my walk home, I passed a small convenience store that I frequented for inexpensive fresh produce that was also open 24 hours. I decided to make a quick stop and get a few more items for dinner. I was in the store for maybe 5 minutes and had truly forgotten about that man from the crosswalk. Except, when I exited the store he was standing outside. I was so startled. It looked like he had been waiting for me. My heart started to pound in my chest, and I was going into survival mode. As soon as I passed him and continued walking home, he also started walking, following right behind me. I could hear his steps and sense him nearby. I needed to make sure that he was really following me so that I could plan my next move. I could see the entrance to the subway just ahead of me. 
I decided I would duck into the subway station to see if he followed me in but, more importantly, to ask for help from the ticket collector. Unfortunately, when I went into the station, the ticket collector was not in the booth. The station was completely empty. No commuters either. I spontaneously decided to hide against a wall to the left, where I could not be seen from the street entrance. 30 seconds later the man walked into the station so nonchalantly, he was almost skipping, as he headed right to the turnstile, as if it was his plan all along to take the train. However at the last minute, he looked behind him, and saw me standing there against the wall. As soon as he saw me he stopped, turned completely around and walked out of the station, no longer intending to go down into the subway. I knew I was undeniably in danger. I took out my phone and called my roommate let's call him Tim, praying he was home and would pick up. He did. I explained in a panic what was happening. Are you home? Can you come get me? I asked. Tim asked me if the man was still there. I carefully peeked around the wall to look out to the street. There was the man. He was standing, smoking and laughing with some guys. He was literally making friends as he waited for me outside the station. I told Tim, yes, the man is still there. A train must have arrived downstairs in the subway, because at that moment, there was suddenly a bunch of people coming through the turnstile and exiting the station. Tim and I agreed that I should leave the station in this crowd of people, stay on the phone with him, and he would meet me on the street essentially, we would walk towards each other. Our house was only a five minute walk away on the same street as the station. When I left the station I had to pass the man. He saw me in the crowd. I saw him throw down his cigarette, and then from behind me I heard him say to the men he had been talking to, I have to go. He continued to follow me. I told Tim everything, since we remained on the phone. I tried to walk as quickly as I could but there was snow and ice on the sidewalk. I don't know why I didn't alert any of the other people who had exited the subway station, and were now walking with me on street. It was sort of this experience of feeling alone in a crowd, if you know what I mean. I knew the man was behind me, but was too scared to look back more than once to check. It felt like an eternity, but I finally saw Tim, walking towards me on the sidewalk. We were both very young, but Tim 20 male is tall, over 6 feet, maybe 186 7 centimeters. I felt a wave of relief as he came to my side. He told me he took a knife from the kitchen to defend us in case. Our house was right ahead. We walked quickly inside and locked the door. With the lights off we looked out the window for the man, but he was nowhere in sight. A few months ago, some piece of shit lowlife broke into my apartment, while I was at work. They rummaged through all my stuff, tearing apart my room. They took a bunch of shit, including a bunch of cash I stored away, my Xbox One, a 40-inch flat screen, and a bunch of food from my pantry. I came home that night to find the apartment had been trashed. It looked like a cyclone had moved through my bedroom. Of course I ended up calling the police, who came right over and investigated the apartment. The person had smashed the window in my bedroom and crawled in. I live on the ground floor, and so it would have been really easy for them. I gave the police a list of all the stuff that went missing along with the serial numbers for the electronics. They unfortunately didn't find any sort of fingerprints or anything they could use and there were no cameras on that side of the building. I called the rental agency for my building about the window, but they told me they couldn't send somebody until the next morning. That was probably the worst weekend of my entire life. The very thought that someone came into my space and decided they wanted my stuff sickens me. Thieves are the worst kinds of people. A couple months went by, and there was no word on any of the stuff that got stolen. I expected that much. Police in my city are useless most of the time. I had already gotten a new TV, and so all I needed was a new Xbox. 
I did some thinking and decided that I wanted to buy one second hand, as I didn't want to spend another $400 on a new console. So I jumped on Craigslist and did some searching. Sure enough, I find a seller who wants to sell his for $250, long with all of his games and controllers. It was a pretty fantastic deal. The only issue was that the guy lived in the next town over. On the other hand, I was getting real tired of not playing video games, and so I gave in. I contacted the guy and inquired about the console. He told me his name was Sam. He seemed like a pretty cool guy, and was even willing to hold it for me if I came and got it that same day. I agreed. I jumped into my car 15 minutes later, and drove the 45 minutes to the next town. The town was very rural, and there were a lot of wooded areas. The house I was trying to find was way out there, next to some old train tracks. I pulled up to the house, which was off a dirt road. It was a real piece of shit, run down and overgrown. The old white paint was almost all chipped away, and the guy had a massive trash pile right in his front yard that was filled with a bunch of old junk, like TV sets and radios. I was unsure if I even had the right house, so I walked up to the door and hesitantly knocked. There was a short wait before I heard somebody shuffling on the other side of the door. It opened and revealed a very thin-looking man with a buzz cut. I took notice that his clothes were filthy. He was wearing a tattered, flannel shirt with ripped blue jeans. You Sam, I asked him. Yeah, you here for the Xbox? I nodded nervously with an MHM. He flashed me a smile and invited me inside. I had a bad feeling, like something wasn't right with this guy. His house was a disaster. Almost every piece of furniture was filled with junk and garbage and it looked like his kitchen hadn't been cleaned in months. I knew right off the bat that he was a hoarder. I was worried about being the awkward one, but this guy was about as awkward as one could get. When I think about it now, I feel like he was probably on the spectrum, but I couldn't be too sure. There was also the smell, like something in his house was rotting away. Like something dead. He lead to into the hallway on the first floor, and stopped at a door that looked much newer than the others in the house. It's right down here, he said. He pushed the door open to reveal stairs leading into a dimly lit basement. Alarms started going off in my head, and I knew that there was something seriously wrong. I stood at the top of the stairs, peering down. Sam stood behind me, almost as if he wanted to make sure I couldn't escape. Go on then, I said stepping out of his way. You first. He replied. His awkward smile had gone to a cold gaze. When I looked towards the basement, the rotting smell had grown even stronger. When I listened closer, I could hear what sounded like millions of flies buzzing around down there. I turned and quickly pushed past him, sprinting down the hallway. He started to pursue, but then he stopped. I ran out the front door and back onto the dirt road, jumping into my car before speeding down the road as fast as my car could go. Before driving off, I caught the glimpse of his smiling face in the front window of the house. I made it home safe, where I realized that he had sent me a text message. The Craigslist ad disappeared after that, and I've since blocked his number. I thought about calling his town's local police, but after I calmed down, I realized there was probably not much they could do about it anyway. Days later, I started getting weird phone calls, usually hang-ups every time. This persisted for several weeks before I saw Sam's mugshot on the local news. I guess he lured another unlucky buyer to his house, and when the buyer also refused to go down to the basement, Sam assaulted him with a knife. Luckily, the buyer managed to fight him off and escape. The police were called, and were shocked at what they found upon searching his house. This sick, twisted F had been killing local dogs and piling them in his basement, where he then did weird experiments on the bodies. The very thought of it made me sick to my stomach, knowing what potentially could have happened to me had I not ran. I don't know what happened to Sam, 
but I sure as hell hope that he's spending his days in a padded cell somewhere. This is gonna be buried, but my geography teacher told us about the time he went hiking and discovered what was left of a base jumper whose parachute didn't deploy properly. The only reason he even saw the body was when he realized that the place he'd sat down to eat lunch in was in fact stained red from finely spread blood splatter, and not just a cool looking rock. He still goes hiking in the same national park once a month. After my second year of college, I wanted to move into an apartment. I had basically no real friends to choose from, so I decided to try Craigslist. I made an ad for housing wanted, described myself, put a picture because I found myself more drawn to messaging people I could actually see first, and my number for texting. I stated I was more interested in rooming with girls I am a girl. This one guy messages me saying his name is Oliver, and he has a nice apartment. The rent was really cheap too cheap, and he said I could have the first month free. I considered it for a while because at the time I had no other good prospects. I talked to him a bit, added him on Facebook to chat over Messenger, so it was a bit faster. I regretted that pretty quick because he started being super weird to me. He was a middle-aged looking guy. He talked about how he worked at a tattoo shop and could get me a job prefacing it by saying that I could just sit and draw, and that it always helped to have a pretty girl drawing at a tattoo shop. At one point I complimented his dog, and he said, thanks, she's the only woman in my life besides my mom. At this point I obviously knew I wasn't going to move in with him, but for a bit it was making me laugh so I talked to him a bit longer. The conversation divulged into him essentially telling me he wanted me to be his girlfriend, I said no. And then he told me he'd pay me $3,000 to fly out to California with him to meet his family, so they would think he had a girlfriend. When I said no he kept begging me and telling me everyone thought he was a loser, and all I'd have to do was hold his hand. Deleted and blocked him on Facebook. Then he began texting me asking me to send him a picture of my boobs. He said, please I never seen 19 year old boobs before. LOL. He continued badgering me despite me only replying once to say no, and that I had a boyfriend. Sent me a picture of his D by the end of it. Surprisingly, he apologized late that night, and never did message me again. Just a freaky freaky coincidence. Bought an orbital sander from a guy a few miles down. He was trying to move out of his place and cleaning out his garage. Tried to get me to buy a few other things. Ended up paying $25. His two kids were playing in the driveway. As I'm walking away, his six-year-old daughter looks me square in the eye and says, thank you. The next day I see in the news that she has died of carbon monoxide poisoning in her sleep. Her piece of shit father was running a generator in the basement, because he was behind on his bills. I was most likely one of the last people to ever talk to her. She haunted my dreams for quite a while. I have yet to use the sander. Should probably throw it away. This experience I am about to share sounds weird, it even sounds weird to me. I can't explain it, and I don't know if anyone else has ever had similar experiences, or if not maybe they should be warned. I'm a bit of a nerd. I love playing with computers, as in I taught myself how to code. I love doing puzzles, so using software and stuff was like figuring out a 3D puzzle. I'm also semi-good at fixing computers. I can't really explain it, but I'm just good at knowing what to do to fix any glitches etc. Okay, so now we have Web3, and I've been playing around to learn about that. I'm trying my best to keep this short and sweet, but that background info is pertinent. So, this is what happened. 
This was early last year in 2023 in spring, I believe in March or possibly earlier. Anyway, I had just woke up. I was just lounging, resting not in any hurry to get up. I was fully awake, when this round semi-globe, like a window, popped up in my wall, right above where the bed headboard is. On the other side of that wall is outside, the front of my house, it's not adjoining a room. Now in this little round window, it was an opening. I could see crystal clear. I could even hear everything. The inside was a church. I could see a piano, hear the music, and see the pews, inside was my old pastor, whose church I no longer attend. That's a long story too. He had on a long cream minister robe with a burgundy wine-colored collar that went around his neck and down the length of the front of the robe. He was scowling. He had his arms crossed, and he was also saying to Lil Nas X the rap singer. I know this sounds crazy, yet it's true and it happened, but he was saying to him, Lil Nas X, that I never listened to him, and it wasn't going to work. There was church music playing in the background. Lil Nas X was bending down and grinning at me, and had a stupid idiotic semi-evil sounding nervous laugh, and glazed looking eyes. He was wearing a dark colored suit, white shirt, and dark tie. He was ready to help me if I had indicated I wanted to go with them. I never said a word, I wasn't afraid, I was just really checking them out wondering what in the world was happening. I'm not a fan of Lil Nas X. I just happen to know who he is. All I really know is he started out singing country music and personally, I think he's foul but anyway. So maybe after a minute, I never said a word. And when Lil Nas X saw I wasn't trying to hop in the whole thing just kind of poofed, and was gone. No hole in the wall, no residue, no anything, just gone. This was totally different, and I'll never forget it. Now maybe a month or two later here is the next really wow moment. I am an admitted nerd, so as I have been checking out Web3, there is a site called Spatial. I'm not trying to advertise for them, but so anyone will better understand. This tripped me out. It is a Web3 site, where you can make an avatar and can create spaces, VR, audio, or use avatars to interact or showcase art or NFTs. Well, they have the option to add portals. These portals are shortcuts to other spaces. You can add them anywhere, to any other space destinations, and you can look and see into the connecting space. It is also a real-time shortcut that you can enter and be in the next space, and this is exactly like what I experienced. But in real life, before ever knowing about spatial. So after I explored this site, and saw that and realized that is exactly what I saw, a real-life portal happened. An exact real-life portal. My husband laughed when I told him, but I told him what if I had gone. How would he explain my disappearance? All the cars were here, the dogs hadn't barked, and no trace would have been left. And they would have had to question him as no one else was here. So that made him think, because he really would not have had a clue but he would be the only suspect. Again, I know this sounds crazy. I've had many strange experiences, and seen lots of paranormal or supernatural things. To me, this is the weirdest so far. I know that it was evil, they couldn't take me against my will. I would have had to be willing to go, I could sense that, and that wasn't happening. I'm still not afraid, just amazed and aware. Wondering if anyone else has experienced anything like this, and if not then just be aware. A few years ago I moved with my family right before I started college. Unfortunately it was kind of far from the university I had been accepted into, so I had been trying to find a place to rent close to my university. My dad helped me and showed me an ad on Craigslist. There was a nice looking house for rent, and it was close to my university. I decided to set up a meeting to go check out the place. I showed up in the afternoon and unfortunately I was alone. My dad said I was an adult and a big guy, 
So I shouldn't worry about meeting this person. This old guy greeted me, and then goes, you'll have to follow me to get to the house for rent. I was confused and said, your ad said this was the house for rent. Why do I have to go somewhere else? He says, this is my house. I'll take you to the one that's for rent. I'm a little concerned at this point and followed him to his other place. I figured if things didn't look right, I'd just leave. We get there and I notice the house looks bad and it looked like people were in it. I didn't see any other cars around, so this seemed odd. He looks at me and says, don't you want to check it out? I said, I don't know. This isn't what was in your ad and it looks like other people are there. He tells me that other people are checking it out and I could join them. Something just felt weird about the whole thing and I told him I wasn't interested anymore. This place looked in bad shape from the outside and appeared to have people in the house. When he asked why I wasn't interested, I told him it was too far of a drive for school and work. He got mad at me and accused me of wasting his time. I said, I'm not the one advertising a house and then telling the person it's not the one for rent. He began to glance nervously towards the house and asked if I was sure I didn't want to check it out. I told him no and left. He never contacted me again thankfully. I'm not sure what his intentions were, but something just felt wrong. Maybe he was just trying to show me the house, but I didn't like that he lied about the house to begin with, and that there were people inside the house. I'm not sure what was going on there, but I didn't really want to find out. I also didn't like how he kept looking at the house when he was asking if I was sure I didn't want to check it out. It seemed so bizarre how he went from being mad at me to getting kind of desperate for me to go inside. One night, about a year ago, I'm lying in my bed and I don't even know that I'm sleeping, but I keep hearing the toilet flush. I keep hearing knocks on the door. I keep hearing voices and then all of a sudden I say, angels, angels, please help me. Next thing I know, this seven foot tall being comes through my ceiling and lands by the bed next to me, and he's completely golden. A seven foot tall muscular, very muscular, blonde hair and blue eyes. He had armor on and a huge sword. Anyway, so I'm like looking at him and I'm like, oh my god, you're so beautiful. Well, a second or two later, my ears started ringing, and then also, the voice came into my head. I'd never heard somebody else's voice in my head, but it was a voice that wasn't coming through my ears. You know what I mean? It wasn't a thought, but it was in my head, and he was speaking this language I'd never heard before. I remember I was trying to tune into it in my mind, trying to hear it better, and it just got louder and louder, like deafening, and then I woke up. I just shook my head, and then I woke up, and it was crazy because I didn't even know that I was asleep. I've been having a lot of dreams like that when I wake up, and I'm able to leave my body and walk around my house, but I can't leave my house yet. What is going on with me, and what kind of language did I hear? Did the Archangel Michael appear before me? Story My husband and I were out cross-country skiing. We had just crossed a remote country road and were about to ski across a field. On the other side of this field, we spotted an extremely large wolf standing just inside of the tree line. I felt uncomfortable as the creature was staring right at us, following our movements. My husband, carrying a 22 rifle on his back on a sling, brought the rifle down, chambered a cartridge, and fired into the ground in front of the creature. The creature looked at the ground, then back at us, and began to growl. The growl went up and down in sound, and it was very deep and menacing. My husband shouldered his rifle again, but did not fire. What really gave me the chills was the look on the creature's face. I felt that the creature knew that the rifle was small caliber, and was not something that could kill it with one shot. Moments later, my husband fired again, this time into a tree next to the creature. 
The creature didn't flinch, but what it did next made both of us flee in terror. About 30 seconds after the second shot, the creature stood up on two legs. One of its front legs arms was against the tree that my husband shot. The growling continued, but it had increased in volume, and the creature was moving its jaws up and down, as if gnashing its teeth. My husband fired three shots directly at the creature, all three hitting it in the chest. The creature let out a drawn-out scream or howl, and ran off into the forest on two legs. We fled the other way back towards our vehicle. As we were skiing back, we had to pass through a small area of the forest. As we were passing through, we could hear something running towards us from a distance through the woods. We cleared the woods without anything happening, but when we broke out of the forest, we estimated that whatever was chasing us was no more than 35-40 yards behind us. I had my cell phone with me, and was thinking about using it to take a picture of the creature. Suddenly, I got a feeling, that if I took a photograph, the creature would kill both of us. The feeling was so strong that I immediately shoved the phone in my pocket. It wasn't as if the creature sent me a psychic message, or anything. It was just a feeling. One thing I must mention, in a hushed, embarrassed voice. When we made it back to our vehicle, I noticed that I had actually peed my pants. I didn't even notice until the adrenaline rush ended. I had been so scared that I lost control of my bladder. I always thought that was, just something from the movies. As a former ranger, I used to work alone near the outside of Big Bend National Park here in Texas. It can be pretty secluded in certain areas. During my time, I can't even begin to tell you how many strange things I saw or heard. But this is one encounter that is still very fresh in my mind. Now, before I go on, I've heard and seen all sorts of incredibly creepy things. I've had my own skinwalker sightings, a Bigfoot sighting, and there are lots of things out there that go bump in the night that many refuse to talk about. If you meet the right people, they are usually willing to open up and speak about it. But you have to be careful, especially when it involves your line of work. It can definitely affect your career, and how you are viewed as a professional. If you're perceived as crazy or being a nut, good luck getting hired anywhere or advancing your career, especially if you tell people that you saw a skinwalker or a Bigfoot. This night though, something happened that I never thought possible. My work partner, another ranger, and I were on duty. We were both driving back from the station when we heard something very odd. It sounded like a woman's scream mixed with the sound of weeping. It was loud, shrill, lasting only a few seconds. The more I think about it, the more my skin crawls. We did not see anything out of the ordinary, just heard the sound. The next day when we checked on our equipment, one of the cameras was not functioning properly. It recorded the sounds that we had heard, but did not capture any kind of visual. Two weeks later, I heard the same sound while I was patrolling, right around 3 in the morning. It was unusually dark when I heard the sound. It instantly sent a chill down my spine, and the immediate feeling of fear gripped me. It was so real and so incredibly bizarre. I thought, what was that? It sounded like it came from a woman but not. I was alone this time and I certainly didn't want to be, not after hearing that. But the only thing I could do was call for backup. At that hour, I would have brought the fear of God to anybody who came out there with me. It sounded like somebody screaming. I mean, I'm not crazy. I know what I heard. I just can't explain it. I'm here to tell you that many people would write this off and just say, Oh, you heard a mountain lion. That's not what this sounded like. I've heard mountain lion and cougar on multiple occasions, and while they can sound like a woman screaming bloody murder, that's not what this sounded like. The tone was audibly deeper, and it just sounded different. I obviously wouldn't have been so terrified if it had sounded exactly like that of a cougar. Now, this would happen again for the few following nights. Each and every time, it would make my skin literally crawl. 
After what I believe to be about three weeks after the initial audible noises that I first heard, my partner and I were working together again, patrolling the same area at the same time. We both see movement off in the distance in the same direction that we'd heard the screams the first few times. My partner was actually the first one to see it and point out the dark figure moving in the distance. I had to squint my eyes and realize that what we were seeing is a creature moving with its mouth wide open, as though it was screaming. We watched it as it moved very quickly to the desert underbrush. The movement from this creature was as if it had glided towards the underbrush, and not typically run like a quadrupedal animal would. The only reason why we didn't immediately panic, was that what we were seeing was just so outrageously bizarre that for the first few seconds, we couldn't handle what we were seeing. Neither of us screamed, and we didn't run like it was some kind of monster ghost, but we did eventually hightail it out of there. I think we were just so shocked and stunned. I'm not saying that I know what this creature is that we saw there in Big Bend National Park. But judging by its physical appearance, it reminded me of what many people claim to be a ghoul. Ghouls are similar to crawlers or rakes in that they are all white, and have very wide open mouths. I only know these things because I decided to do a little bit of research into cryptozoology after the sighting to try and educate myself on what it is that I saw. The main reason being I wanted to know if these things are dangerous or pose a threat. From everything I've read, they definitely do. I can't prove it was a ghoul, but based on everything that I saw and experienced, things all point to that. I don't want to just write this off as nothing because nothing will never terrify me as personally as this did. I've been having nightmares about it pretty much non-stop. I figured sharing my experience with the world is probably the best thing I can do. After all, this is not something that you hear about every day. But I know I did not want to go back there. I'm planning on making an official report eventually for the National Park Service, but we wanted to get more information out there from users. This is one of the many things that has happened over the course of my career. Feel free to ask questions. It was 2.30 am, and another night of not being able to sleep due to back pain. I was lying on my side, reading, when my very close by neighbor's motion detector light turned on. This happens from time to time. When it turns on, it lights up the entire side of my house. We have lived here for nine years, and I have never once seen anything walk past my bedroom window at night. Since I was facing my large bedroom window, the very bright motion detector light going off caught my attention. I looked up and saw the side silhouette of a dogman, I said. Holy crap, it was walking past my bedroom window. I saw it from mid shoulders up. The shoulders were huge, and its head was huge. It had pointed ears, like a German shepherd dog, and a long snout. Its mouth was slightly open, as I saw a large tongue that seemed to be lolling to the side of its mouth. When I saw this creature and spoke those words, I could swear that thing slowed down, smirked, and then kept going. That's all I saw that night. Last week though, while in my bedroom again, I heard something huge land on the ground behind my bedroom wall. That wall has no windows. I heard deep, kind of raspy breathing. I started praying, pleading the blood of Jesus over my house, the grounds around it, and all. I do this most nights, but sometimes I forget. I'm awake most nights until 3 a.m. or later due to having severe spine issues, as well as fibromyalgia. We live in a lovely manufactured home community. There are lots of trees around here, and it's very close to canals, large open fields, and woods. I know this is what I saw, but the fact that I saw it has left me amazed. Why is that when so many are also seeing them? I guess I just thought since I am in the house most of the time due to my health, I would never see them. The space between my neighbor's house and ours is about 10 feet. My husband went outside weeks later once I got the courage to tell him this had happened, and measured the area by the window. That dogman had to be at least 8 feet tall. 
What concerns me greatly is that no one in the police department or government will alert people to their existence. People are walking around feeling a false sense of security. I know I did. I won't even try to walk outside anymore. And yes, I have cautioned my neighbors. The ones with the security light. I can't think of any other details right now, but it's important for you to know that several years ago, a homeless woman was camping out down by the river here in Albany. She was found dead, and her tent was really torn up. I believe the police report in the newspaper said she was torn up as well, but I honestly can't remember any of the details. To the best of my knowledge, no one was ever caught for that crime. This is a sleepy town, just over 50,000 people. We no longer get the newspaper, so I have no idea if this has happened again. I do know that a couple was down by that same area and saw a dogman. It really frightened them badly. About three years ago, I encountered what I could only explain then as a deformed hyena. It was in the later part of the day under dusky conditions, and I was small game hunting at the time. I did not feel any fear because I was carrying my over under shotgun at this time. Its eyes were kind of strange, and I remember it had very pointy ears. Its head was almost cartoon-like as its snout had messed up overgrown hair. Its fangs look unusually long too. For some time before I seen it, I heard a very very long coughing noise, like a cat coughing up a fur ball. However this went on for a long time, so whatever did it had strong and large lung capacity. I doubt a lynx or cat could have been the noise maker. I have no idea if this dog-like creature was the source of this strange and long coughing fit. Another strange thing along this trail, I always seem to be under the watchful eyes of a high-flying turkey vulture. Now these are newcomers to Alberta, but a few mating pairs have been reported up here, and this is common local knowledge that no one questions. This coughing bout I have heard at least onth before in this specific area. Never seen the source in the nearby dense boreal forest. This wooded area is kind of on the edge of oil exploration, and is an active work area now so I don't hunt there anymore. Which is too bad as it's chock full of small game such as rabbits and grouse. During this encounter the woods were unnaturally quiet, it's hard to move in many areas off trail because the evergreen limbs reach so far close to the ground an upright person would be stooped over to move at any kind of speed in many areas. Quadrapes have a definite advantage here over people and the area is also ringed with swamps and marshy very uneven goron that one could easily turn your ankle on. There were other strange moments then, I think when I did see this animal, I sat down on a large rock with my gun across my lap, and caught the first glimpse, as it was circling me I think to catch my scent on the wind. I just caught a glimpse of it passing behind a tree in the dusky light conditions. It had hawks like a dog. But as it came around the tree, still on all four legs I noticed the front legs were longer than the back legs, its back bowed upward, and I got the distinct impression its frontal back, chest and leg muscles were much more pronounced and muscular than its back legs. I believe the front coat was a lighter color with some reddish tones too. Looked like a hyena loose in North America to my own eyes. It w is not a black bear. I am very familiar with bears. It was canine-like, but not any canine I have ever seen before or since. My brother he was not there found a near-perfect picture of another critter online, on another crypto site, and the picture was said to be taken very near the Wisconsin River. In the picture it looked like it was on farmland corral or fence line, in the early spring because of white and light snow cover was the near twin to what I saw that fall evening in Alberta. My encounter took place many years ago. I never had the faintest explanation for it until a couple months ago, when I randomly stumbled across Dogman on the internet. I was in my early 20s, working swing shifts at the time and commuting about 100 miles each way, so it was usually around 2 in the morning by the time I got home. 
I saw the monster as I called it on the northernmost section of Trunk Road in the Matanuska Valley in Alaska. This area is roughly smack in between the towns of Palmer and Wasilla. I was only about 10 miles from home at that point, so it must have been around 2 am. Trunk Road is a narrow, two-lane road, consisting of nothing but twists and turns. The surrounding terrain is somewhat swampy and thick with black spruce. It was late October, days before Halloween. There was no snow on the ground, but it was cold enough to be wary of ice. I was driving an 82 Subaru SW, going about 20 miles per hour around a curve, when my headlights caught a large, dark figure up ahead. I'm bad at judging distance, maybe six car lengths away. I instinctively let off the gas, coasting closer. At first I assumed it was a moose, as the area is infested with them. But no, it was standing upright. Bear then. No, not a bear. It looked so strange. Tall enough to be an uncommonly large bear, but far too slender, and it looked like it had spikes running down its neck and back. A Halloween prop. Odd but effective place for one. All those thoughts ran through my head in a fraction of a second. The car was still coasting closer, and I could see more details. It was standing in profile, gazing across the road. I could clearly see its wolfish muzzle, large, upright ears. The spikes on its back were in fact clumps of fur. Its spine curved in a smooth, very natural looking way. It was standing in the ditch, inches from the pavement. Because I was focused on its upper body, I do not recall anything about its back legs, or if it had a tail. I did see its front legs though. Very doggy looking, hanging awkwardly down and slightly toward its front, exactly as you'd expect if a dog stood upright. While it clearly had a canine look, there was still something off about it that I cannot articulate. It was perfectly still, and at this point, given the proximity to Halloween, I was quite convinced it was some sort of Halloween prop, because it was clearly not any kind of existing animal. I was deeply impressed and gently stepped on the brakes, intending to stop and examine it closely. Then it turned its head towards me. In the tiny fraction of a second that it took for it to swivel its head, I knew I had made a terrible mistake. The fluidness of its movement removed any and all doubt that this was some kind of prop. It was horribly, terrifyingly alive. The pale, off-white glow of its eyeshine in the headlights destroyed any possibility of a human in a costume. I think I sat there gaping at it in shock for a few seconds, the car barely moving by now, but still inching closer. As I was almost upon it, I think it could have leaned forward and touched the car if it had wanted I had to look up to see its face. Again I'm a bad judge of such things but I am five foot four. And it was a hell of a lot taller than me. Tall like a polar bear standing. Seven feet, eight. I really can't say. I snapped out of my trance and slammed on the gas. The car fishtailed and I prepared myself for death by monster, as I was certain I'd end up in the ditch. But the tires caught the pavement, and I drove like a complete maniac all the way home. I did not look back. I have only been on that section of road a few times since, never alone and never in the dark. For the next several years of driving that commute, I went 20 plus miles out of the way to avoid trunk road. The thing never made any aggressive moves, but there was something about it that felt very, I don't know, predatory. I never saw anything remotely like it again, and never heard any stories about it in the area. I just wanted to share an incident that I experienced in Point Pleasant, West Virginia where I went to high school. I was in a video production class right around the time, the movie The Mothman Prophecies with Richard Gere was being made. So we decided to make a documentary. We spoke to a woman in her 70s who, during the time of the original sightings back in the 1960s, said that she was out riding her horse one day and she said she suddenly felt someone sit down behind her. All of a sudden the horse bucked her off and went crazy. She chased the horse down and then looked at the horse. Burned into the flesh of the horse were the legs of a humanoid. 
she immediately got in contact with a veterinarian, who came to their farm to treat the horse. The veterinarian never asked how the horse got burned, as if he had seen this type of burn before. Other than the burn, the horse was fine. Later that week, she confided to a friend that whatever it was that sat behind her on the horse had very thin, insect-like legs. She also said that it had the odor of ammonia. She also said that when she was backed off the horse, she caught a glimpse of the being on the horse. She saw a huge butterfly-like wings that were yellow in color. She swears up and down that this was the Mothman. Also, it turns out that the veterinarian was one of the 46 victims who died during the Silver Bridge collapse on December 15, 1967. I just thought that was an interesting story. Let me preface this letter with a quick description of my background. I am a retired military veteran with three decades of active duty serving my country and its citizens. I've been honored and privileged to be in command on many occasions during my career, and have seen both the bounty of peaceful time, and the horror of all-out war. You name it I've probably seen it and been through it in the S military. I do not write this to impress, I merely wish to state the facts so that you may judge the accuracy of what I'm about to tell you. So now, the facts as I know them to be my first face-to-face -face encounter with Dogman. It was five years ago in 2019, and there have been more since then my first Dogman experience took place in the western United States. I have a cabin in a national forest which is nestled in a beautiful valley located 50 miles up a dirt road at a fairly high elevation, and is only accessible from late spring to late fall depending on how early or late the snowfall is each year. Most years it is impossible to get to the cabin from Thanksgiving through Labor Day due to heavy snow and ice on the dirt road that runs up to that part of the National Forest. But four years ago in January, there was no snow, and since it is rare to be able to go there at that time of year, a friend and I decided to risk it, and go up for New Year and planned on staying a week or so. We decided that if snow started falling while we were there, we'd retreat from it quickly and drive out in time before the road became impassable and safely make it down the mountain. We launched from the city, got to the cabin around midday, and found there were a few inches of snow on the ground around it. Ever alert for animal tracks and prints I examined the snow for them I found bear, deer, cougar prints, and something else I was unfamiliar with and had never seen before. I now know that they were dogman tracks. Not knowing what the dogman track were at the time I first saw them, I filed them away in my mind as a new experience and a new bit of data. Then my friend and I began powering up and commissioning the cabin, turning on the power and the water and the gas. The cabin has living quarters on one side and a huge garage with two huge aircraft-style hangar doors to slide open. I unlocked and opened the hangar doors about six feet wide. Then my friend and I began unloading the supplies from my jeep parked in the carport and took them through the hangar and into the cabin proper. As the afternoon progressed we settled in, restocked the cabin supplies, and cleaned a bit here and there. I never go unarmed into that wilderness, so one of the first things I like to do when I get to the cabin is to lay out whatever weapons I have brought with me on a big table out in the hangar. I did this and checked and loaded all the weapons. I also turned on and stocked the gas-powered refrigerator which I keep out in the hangar with some of the food I had brought that needed to be kept cool. Then I returned inside the cabin proper, and settled in for an adult libation, and an afternoon and bowl session with my friend. After a bit of telling stories between ourselves, I noticed the sun had set behind the mountains, and it was beginning to get dark outside. It was time to begin prepping for dinner, I told my friend I would get some steaks out of the fridge in the hangar, and went to do so. That's when something completely unexpected happened. As I walked through the door from the cabin into the hangar, I took one, two, three steps and froze. I was being sighted by something outside. It was staring at me through the open hangar doors with murderous intent. In that split second, 
all the hair on the back of my neck and arms stood straight up, and I started getting what I call my gut warning. I've only gotten those before when flying into live fire from the ground, or when in other combat situations in wartime. Yet, here I was in the middle of the American wilderness getting the very same well-known sensation stronger than ever. I was pretty certain that it was not a human. I didn't freeze but my brain began racing. Instead of walking to the fridge I quickly went over to the weapons table, picked up a large gauge handgun, checked if it was loaded, and stuck it in my belt. Then I picked up one of the already loaded rifles. Once armed I then advanced towards the open hangar doors with the rifle in my hands. I got to the open hangar doors I raised the rifle and started appraising the situation through its scope, swinging it to the left and to the right. It was so dark by then that I could see little but vague tree shapes and the blobs of bushes outside in the forest. Then suddenly, as I swung the rifle to the right, the feeling of being intently watched switched off like flipping a light switch off. I stood there for a bit waiting for the tingle of my intuitive gut warning sign to reappear. After a little while the feeling of being watched didn't return, so I closed and locked the hangar doors, grabbed some dinner steaks from the fridge, and went back inside. Later that night after dinner and KP duty, I armed myself, opened the cabin door, and stood in the doorway. As soon as I did the feeling of being watched started up again, only not as intense as the first time. I stood there for a while, and then once again the feeling of being watched switched off like a switch. The rest of the evening I turned the sequence of events around and around in my head, but could not make any sense of this creature. It just didn't add up. Could it have been a murderous bear that had gotten a taste for, long pig human flesh? All of these thoughts and more went through my mind as I sat there gazing at the wood stove fire in front of me inside the cabin and eventually, I gave up obsessing about it. I told my friend we should hit our racks so we turned in and slept straight through the night with no further incidents. You're probably asking why I didn't leave the cabin the next day. All I can say is that I am perhaps a little too stubborn and have never believed in retreat of any kind. To me, that is paying for the same ground twice, and you have to remember that I've been going to my cabin for 20 years now and have never experienced anything like being watched or hunted. Not ever, not even close. The next morning we did the usual shower and shave routine, and while having a cup of coffee outside in the carport, the feeling of being watched returned, only it was weaker, as if it was from a distance. As the feeling of being watched returned, I still couldn't make heads or tails of the situation I found myself in, but I was adapting as fast as I could. So, I told my friend we would be staying close to the cabin for the duration of our stay. I didn't want to take any chances with this new unknown threat, so I told my friend that I was concerned about bears in the area. My friend took this at face value and agreed to stay close to the cabin and its immediate grounds for the duration of our stay. In the days that followed, I got the sensation of being watched from time to time during the day, but it was always weak and seemed to be from far away. But every time I opened the cabin door at night, and stood there looking out into the night, the feeling returned very strong and very close, like it was that very first night inside the partially open hangar doors. I forgot to mention that I have a pair of Generation 3 military night vision goggles, I use these every night when standing at the cabin door looking for whatever was outside watching us. Each and every time I put the goggles on the feeling of being watched switched off as I explained earlier. This whole situation was darn peculiar, and I just couldn't explain any of it in a rational way that made sense. All I knew was my training from the past, and that if I stuck to that, then my friend, and I would be okay. If I developed a plan for the day I felt it would be alright, and after all, we had plenty of weapons and food. The procedure I settled on was simple. Don't go outside at night, don't leave any doors open, and stay very close to the cabin at all times. Most of the time we sat in the carport on folding camping chairs just shooting the breeze. Also, keep yourself armed and have extra firearms close at hand, 
and most important, never ever go anywhere alone. By midweek, after being at the cabin for four days, we began to get used to this watcher, because it too was following a set of rules, and never came into sight. It stayed a certain distance from the cabin. It made absolutely no noise at any time at night. It came closer and stared at the cabin, and waited for me to open the door and look around. As soon as I used the night vision goggles, it took off and so forth and so on. On the fourth day at the cabin, my friend insisted on going on a hike. I sensed that I would have the opportunity to figure out who the watcher was. I was using my friend as bait, for what I was mentally calling the watcher, but I really wanted to know what this thing was. I figured my friend would be safe with me well armed, and watching them from a distance. So we agreed that he would hike down the dirt road for a short distance, and then come back. My friend got ready to go, excited to get away from the cabin for a spell. I armed myself well. I holstered and put a large bore revolver on each hip. I double checked the load on my R15, and slung it in front of me. Then, at the last moment, I don't know why, I slung my old trusty full auto machine gun on my back. It is what you might call the spoils of war, and has never failed me in the past. My friend was ready to launch down the road, and I was just as ready to watch him do so. He took off and I watched as he walked down the cabin access road to the main dirt road. As soon as he was out of sight, I jogged over to a knoll that had a commanding view of the road, and the entire valley and worked my way into some old growth bushes. From there I watched as my friend started going down the road, and within an instant, I saw something else just off the road behind my friend. It was big and black and stood upright on two legs, and it was fast. It had a weird flippy floppy zigzagging gait, but it zipped from tree to tree incredibly fast, following my friend as he walked down the road. In an instant, I knew that this thing was the watcher that had been spying and watching us all week, and it was not a bear. I raised my rifle and tried to see it through the scope. My first glimpse of it was its head and upper body. It had the head of a dog. I swear it had the head of a huge dog. A little stunned I suddenly remembered my training and lowered my rifle sight to its legs. I saw huge muscular legs like those you would see on an Olympic heavyweight lifter. Its short dense black fur became sparse going down to its feet and those toes had huge curved talons, not nails. They weren't quite as big as the velociraptor dinosaur talons from the Jurassic Park movies that everyone in the western world has seen, but they were almost as big, and they looked incredibly lethal, like overkill, lethal in a split second. I took this all in. Then I pulled the rifle back up to sight on its head and chest, and it was staring back at me, staring directly at me from about 100 yards away. I got a good look as it stared at me. It had a huge head, I would say much bigger than a human. It had short smooth black fur and a huge jaw that was slightly parted. I saw large white canine teeth in its mouth. Its eyes were deep dark red, and as I watched, it started to squint its eyes and really got a good look at me. The longer I looked at it, and it looked back at me my brain tried to compare it to other dogs I've seen in my life. To me, its head looked like a cross between a German Shepherd and a Black Lab. But it was huge, absolutely huge. I got the sense that this thing was mean and pissed off. I instinctively decided to shoot it. Just as I put my finger on the trigger of my R, and was about to pull it, I was interrupted by the noise of a vehicle coming up the dirt road in the distance. I stopped sitting on the beast for an instant and looked down the road, and then I swung my gaze back to the beast. It was gone. I lowered my rifle and scanned for it, and I couldn't believe what I saw. It was running away, faster than anything I've ever seen run. It ran through the trees so fast it was a blur, and was running on two legs. Then it burst out of the tree line, and went to all four limbs, and actually increased its speed. It started going through a boulder field, and then took off upslope at such a terrific speed that I remember saying to myself out loud, you've got to be kidding me, nothing runs that fast. I watched as it got to the steep granite mountainside across the valley, 
and it just went straight up it, seemingly floating over the rock, it was so fast, and it was gone in seconds. I tried to process what I had seen. As the vehicle came up the road, it was a US Forest Service Jeep with a ranger inside making his rounds for the week. The ranger stopped and talked to my friend down in the road, and I watched as they chatted away. Eventually, my friend finished talking to the ranger, then he started up his jeep and drove off. My friend started hiking back to the cabin. When my friend returned to the cabin, it was late in the day, and I told them we'd be leaving the next day. Obviously, I walked around outside the cabin heavily armed after that. A little while later I noticed the ranger in his jeep parked down at my access road gate. I walked down there to chat as I've known that guy for about the past 10 years. We talked about nothing for a few moments, and then I said, Hey, have you ever seen or heard reports of a huge dog running around these parts? The guy looked at me oddly and very coldly said, We don't talk about that stuff. Without another word, he started his jeep and drove off as I was in the middle of saying, What do you mean? What aren't you saying? What's going on? I looked back up the road thinking to myself what the heck is going on up here. It's never been like this before and so forth. I walked back to the cabin. I couldn't get the image of that dog face with the red eyes out of my head that night inside the safety of the cabin. My friend chattered on about how good the hike was while I listened absentmindedly, I replayed over and over in my head, the events of that day. My mind kept returning to the image I had seen in my rifle scope, and began filling in details that I hadn't noticed in the heat of the moment of that first real look at the creature. I finally got a few hours of sleep and slept in a bit. The next morning I woke happy to see the daylight and thinking for the first time in my life that I'd be glad to leave the cabin that day. But little did I know our last day at the cabin would turn out to be the strangest one of all. In the mid-1980s, I was told about an encounter that occurred not too far from State College, Pennsylvania Center County. A 19-year-old local resident happened to be looking out his bedroom window, which provided an excellent view of a pasture just west of his house. It was early morning about 6.30 a.m. local time, but there was plenty of light to see clearly. He was in the process of getting ready for work. When he looked out the window, he noticed a tall, hairy creature walking in the pasture, coming from the north. The creature was taking long smooth strides, and its arms moved back and forth as a human would. It did not appear to have a neck, but was capable of turning its head, as it was constantly looking around. Except for the face, the creature was covered entirely with brown or black medium-length hair. The witness was able to see the face and noticed that the forehead protruded distinctly. Also, it appeared the nose was wide and pushed close to the face. The height was approximately 8 feet. As the witness observed, the creature continued walking until it was south of the house. Suddenly, the creature stopped walking when the witness noticed two other similar creatures join it. Both were about about a foot shorter than the first. At this point, one of the creatures reached down and picked up a piece of lumber that was part of a new shed being built. The larger creature started walking swiftly towards the house until it was within 50 feet of the residence. It stopped suddenly, made a few loud grunting sounds, and glared toward the window from where the witness was watching. The witness ducked and crawled to the far end of the bedroom. After a few minutes, the witness got up and looked out the window. The creatures were gone. Later that day, the witness and a friend discovered large, unusual tracks in the pasture. It's not known if this incident was ever reported, but I do know that at least one local police officer knew what had happened and confirmed it with me. He seemed to be convinced that the witness was upstanding and honest, but very private. The witness did move away from the area not long after the encounter fearing that the creatures would harm him. You know that Indian folklore and part tells the truth. I'll explain. Back in December 2001 to be exact, 
I went on a cruise to the Caribbean. It was a Royal Caribbean cruise. On our third or fourth day, we landed in Puerto Rico. One hour into port, a group of 10 of us got a tour guide for just about an hour. Well, the tour guide was explaining spots of interest on the island, but since it was like a rainy overcast day, he said that it wouldn't be possible to visit those sites. He took us to the beach in San Juan. We all got out, the sun was out just for like 20 minutes. I was married to my ex-wife at the time, and I was taking pictures of her just a couple feet from our tour bus. Well, I saw the clouds coming in, the cloud was shaped almost like an arrow, and at the tip of the arrow were two giant birds. They both had white rings on their necks, one was way larger, and the other one was about the size of a Cessna propeller airplane. I yelled to the tour guide to look up at the clouds and repeated to all the members to look up. But by that time, the two giant birds went straight up higher than the clouds. Then the rain came down and we quickly got into the bus. Nobody believed me. I took pictures of the cloud. I still have them, but the birds weren't in the view. Indian legend says these birds bring rain clouds to villages that are in need of rain for planting their harvest. In a way the Indians were right. I live in North Carolina, Durham specifically. My family lives in a standard two-story house in the middle of a run-of-the-mill neighborhood lots of intersecting roads etc. On the night of the question, my family was going to visit a relative who had given birth recently in Greensboro, so I had the house to myself. I was getting home at around 8-9 pm and decided to bring my dog in. She stays outside in the kennel for the day until we bring her in for the night. Our house has a garage attached to the left of it, and the garage has a back door that leads into the backyard. Her kennel is just to your right as you exit the door, with a 4-5 or five feet clearance or path between it, and the garage there is also a bed of rock just up against the house, which will be important. She had recently been taken to the vet for her distressed behavior, which is why I had to stay home to be with her. The evening went fine. I watched a movie to pass the time. I then took her out to use the bathroom before being put up for the night, around 12 1. I took her out the back garage door with her long leash, I was wearing socks and didn't feel like getting them soaked. She usually does her business in that little clearing between the kennel and garage, so I let her walk through it. Our garage has a single light on the back wall, not LED or really bright so I can see her somewhat well while she does it. She's facing me when suddenly her backside lifts almost one or two feet into the air. I assumed some wild dog or something had tried to drag her. She runs back to me and I hear rustling among the rocks, and this figure stops right as it enters visible view in the light. I've never seen anything like it in my life. It was tall. I'm six foot two and I had to look slightly up to see where I thought its head was. It was pale but not white or gray, just a normal pale flesh color like someone who spends a week or two indoors. It was lanky, not really anorexic or anything but definitely disproportionate. It looked at me for a good one two seconds before it backtracked in the quickest manner I could ever replicate. As soon as it went I booked it back inside. I was torn about calling the police if neighbors who had heard my scream hadn't. Behold almost half an hour later, the police arrive in my driveway, I told them that I had seen a man in the backyard, leaving out the whole tall demon crap going on. I have been contemplating whether it was some creature or some NBA bound nude meth head. Once again, I don't count myself as a believer in the Bigfoot or Mothman, but I really don't know WTF happened. I'm most definitely not taking the dog out alone anytime soon. What the hell is was thing? Why was it in a suburban neighborhood? Should I bother telling my family when they get back? I was driving up to visit my dad in Clear Lake, California. 
I was on a route that took Highway 20 which winds through hills and rocks that sidles along Cache Creek in some spots and goes through Indian Reservation. I left really early in the morning to try and get to his place around 6 a.m. I hadn't seen him in some years, had never been up to his place there, and wanted to go fishing with him, his retirement pastime. So I'm rolling along about 3 a.m., it's dark as f out there and I come around a turn onto a straight section of the road. I can see down the road far enough to see the next bend, and across the road looks like there's a parking lot. I can see the silhouette of cars parked on the opposite side of road, but as I approach something seems off. It looked like there were 15-20 cars parked randomly around the dirt between the road and the drop down to the creek, and at least a dozen or more people just kind of standing around. Not all together, not really in groups of more than two randomly dispersed around the cars. No fire, no flashlights, no headlights, no interior lights. It was like they were in stasis until I got closer. I could see heads turning my way, and one of the people starts running toward the road as I approach the corner trying to wave me down. Nope. I gassed around the turn and left them in my tail lights. I've come to understand that there are outfitters that lead rafting trips down the creek, but at the time of year in question, it's too low for that. Debutief were all of those people doing standing around in the dark. Why would they need to flag down some rando in the middle of nowhere in the middle of the night? It just had bad vibes all around, and my instincts have served me well over the years, so that as they say is that. Lived in eastern Kentucky all my life, a cousin and I were out just walking through the hills when she took a step her leg fell through an old wooden box, and when we started looking around there where rocks standing up in rows we kept looking, and there was an old bigger rock someone had scraped the words only little ones buried here it was an old graveyard of all kids. Our family owned the land for almost 80 years, and no one knew it was there. Of course when we told it they all went to look. Then one day me and my same cousin, and a neighborhood kid went out again. We found a small cave, nothing unusual about that in the hills, but it had old chains bolted to it with some kind of old rusty cuffs. Like for people there were also old rusty cans and a pot way up a mountainside. I've always wondered why they were there, and who was chained up. Quick stop after snowboarding at Snowbowl in Flagstaff, Arizona, one early evening in winter. Not dark yet, but nearing sunset. Found what we thought was a secluded and romantic place before my partner, and I would be going out separate ways for a couple weeks. Pulled off on a forest road right off the mountain, walked a short distance and noticed I was not alone. There were dead animals littered on the ground next to me. Not just any though, they were all babies. Different species as well, foxes, javelina, coyotes. I tell my partner who then sees more dead animals over where he is about 20 feet away. We realized they were everywhere. We felt extremely sickened and got out of there fast. This has been about 8 years back, but it was clear none of them were used for their meat, and all were destroyed, bellies cut open, weird stuff. Honestly it was so disturbing, I did not want to look closely. Did report to game and fish non-emergency, and never heard anything back. In the middle of the hills. Riding my horse through the hills my horse started snorting. I smelled a back smell, but my nose was runny anyways from allergies. My horse kept stopping and wanting to turn back. I had to go forward or I could not get to where I was going. We got to a big rut like where a stream once was, and there was a big tarp with cinder blocks on top of it. My horse was so nervous he rushed past it real quick jumping over it. I turned around to look and saw an arm. This was before cell phones. Rode home fast as I could and told my mom. The cops came and I had to show them where it was. Long story short, turned out to be a hooker. They figured she had only been there a day or two.
My friend and I trespassed into the old and abandoned train station in our town. It was a huge abandoned complex with a three-story office building on one side, and the giant wooden and concrete station on the other side with three four stories. This place had been abandoned for 20 plus years at least. We already knew that within the last 5-10 years, someone had been cooking meth in part of the building and a fire broke out. So one end was pretty burned down. We came in at the second story of the station to see the roof and floor caving in to the first level from the fire. As we continued on the daylight was no longer reaching the interior of the building, so we turned our torches on. We saw proof of a homeless population living there, but no one was around. We kept on through the building trying to get to the other side, where there was more natural light that would lead out toward the office building. Okay so the creepiest thing I remember seeing in this very old, very abandoned and filthy place was all in one room in the middle of the station. The ceilings had to be 15 feet high or more, and on one end of the wall in one cavernous room were cages. These cages or cells were as tall as the ceiling. One cell could easily fit an elephant I swear. But these cells were immaculately clean. The metal wasn't tarnished or rusting, and there was even brand new wooden boards along the top and bottom of these cells that looked like they had just been installed. There was nothing in any of the cages. We left the station and went to the office building, where we found two dudes stripping copper from the walls. It was unnerving because we were two girls in our early 20s but neither party said a word, and that's when we left. In college, my girlfriend at the time, and I needed to find an apartment for only one semester, which was impossible to find affordably in a college town. We ended up looking on Craigslist and living in a 2BR with this guy, let's call him Dirty Dan. Dirty Dan was in his early 30s, he was pretty much a stereotype nerd. Really tall and chubby, a gross beard and really long gross hair, loved dungeons and dragons and video games and stuff like that. But he seemed nice, and he had a fully furnished apartment, and the rent was low. Dirty Dan became a terror to us. Here are some of his traits. His nice demeanor turned out to be the stereotype, nice guy behavior. He was low-key an asshole, and thought that acting polite entitled him to female attention. He didn't go to school or work, because he received social security for some undisclosed medical problem. Which meant he never left the house ever. Which would be one thing, but... He never left the living room, despite having his own large bedroom. He spent all of his time in there including constantly falling asleep on the couch for hours and snoring. We basically could not use the living room, unless we wanted to hang out with him, which we didn't, because he drove us crazy. When we had friends over and did use the living room, he would just sit there awkwardly and silently on his computer, while we were hanging out or watching a movie with them. Then he would try to watch Let's Play videos on his laptop with the volume up, and no headphones while we were all there. Or he would fall asleep while we were all watching a movie and snore. He also only laid down, never sat up, so he always took up half the couch. He would invite himself to things we were doing, like we would be leaving to go somewhere, and he would just leave with us and invite himself. He got into some polyamorous relationship with two incredibly annoying girls. They would always be over in the living room too and they spent most of their time discussing their sex life loudly, or looking at BDSMP on his Wii internet browser. He acted super creepy to any female friend we brought over, and as soon as they left would try to friend them on Facebook, and hit on them. He would drink all of our alcohol. He was super passive-aggressive, bitchy and paranoid. He became convinced that we were legitimately going to try and steal his cats, after we made a passing joke about it. He was totally filthy. Wore the same like, thermal man leggings and t-shirt every day, the bathroom and fridge were disgusting when we moved in, and if we didn't diligently clean them, he would let them become disgusting again. 
We grew to basically spend all our time in the apartment in our room, and absolutely hate having to interact with him. He had no social graces at all, and was passive-aggressive bitchy, and I heard more about his mountain troll sex life than anyone should. Kill Dirty Dan. Had just bought an old house, needed some roommates to help pay the bills. It was pre-GFC, and I doubt the bank would have lent me 300k plus on a 35k salary today. The few people who responded included a girl who wanted to know where she could put her five wardrobes, and another girl who wanted to know what equestrian facilities I was offering. Even though I kept telling her that it's only equine link, was that there were horses in a paddock on the other side of the road. Okay, but do you have an arena? How many seats does it have? Eventually I was forced to lower my already very low standards, and took on some very sub-par housemates. Housemate 1 was as skinny as a rake, and took my, hey I'm cool, you can smoke whatever in the big shed if you want to mean, hey, why don't you and all your mates spend every night in the shed blasting Metallica through tiny speakers, leaving bongs everywhere and using my jars of nuts and nails as target practice. Housemate 2 seemed like a better candidate. He was unmarried, morbidly obese and between jobs, but was a qualified former chemical engineer with no pets. Only he wasn't. Firstly, the day before he moved in he admitted that he had a Maltese Terrier, and had intentionally not mentioned it, because he hadn't been able to find a place that would let him have a pet. I hate yappy dogs, but to its credit, it was pretty chill. Later I discovered that qualified chemical engineer is code for I once worked at a paint factory. Then he started bringing very young boys into his room at random hours who he introduced as his nephews, even though they very clearly were not. As if that wasn't disturbing enough, they actively avoided me, and did not look or talk to anyone else in the house, as if they had been instructed to stay quiet. He and his dog would spend the entire day sleeping in his room. As in, he may emerge once or twice a day to use the bathroom or kitchen, but that was it. The dog had a bowl which he kept full of food at all times, which brought in mice from outside. I asked him to feed his dog by putting food in it once a day, and he informed me that wouldn't be possible as the dog likes to snack. I told him that the mice had to go and if that meant his dog had to go, then so be it. He took the bowl away. Predictably, this made him get even bigger. He must have been more than 200 kilograms by this stage. But it wasn't caused by him sleeping all day. He blamed it on the chemicals at the paint factory he once worked at. In fact, he was trying to get a disability pension, so he wouldn't have to work again. Eventually the arguments between Metallica housemate and Lazy housemate over the late night music got to the point where Lazy housemate took out an AVO against Metallica housemate because he threatened to stab his dog when he shouted at him to turn the music down. I decided the drama wasn't worth 2 by $100 per week, so I kicked them both out. A dear friend of mine who has since passed away hired a gardener through Craigslist. The gardener robbed him when my friend went to a different state for a wedding, and kidnapped my friend's roommate. Gardener stole his car, drove his stuff and the roommate to another state, dropped it off with the gardener's brothers where the roommate was held hostage for a day. The stuff including plasma TV was fenced during this time. My friend gets home from his wedding, and his garage door is open, other car is gone, and no one in sight. He walks inside to find his two dogs locked in a closet having eaten pillows for food. They needed surgery later. He calls the cops. Later that evening the roommate calls my friend for a pay phone. He was released by the brothers after all the stuff was fenced. But the gardener took the car and led police on a high-speed chase. The gardener spent some time in jail, and sent my friend a Christmas card that year, apologizing. This story is completely true, and if anyone wants more deets I can answer questions. It was told to me by my friend, 
I miss him very much at a restaurant in what I consider to be the greatest story ever told to me. It came up because one guy at the table was talking about how great Craigslist is, and my friend said, well actually let me tell you a story. In a really bad place of my life, meet a girl off Craigslist dated. Whole thing turned south pretty fast. But being in a really bad place in my life, ignored all the warning signs. Broke contacted, moved away moved on with my life. Couple months later she sent me a text saying, I know what you did, that's a felony the cops will come after you. Now being afraid this woman I called her and said WTF. Apparently, someone posted a video of her onto one of those revenge porn sites. I told her I never did it, and I'm happy now and don't want to be dragged down by her because, I was happy now. Hung up and thought nothing of it. Fast forward two weeks, and she sent me a long text message, that she was the one that posted it there, and was hoping it would be the attention she needed to bring me back into her life. That's when I changed my phone number. Depression and Craigslist dating do not mix. Was looking for roommate somehow this person thought I was a girl. Kept sending d pics, and I kept texting I am a dude. He was like sure girl. The things I would do blah blah. Finally I had enough told this guy come to my house. Idiot shows up with flowers. I come out and tell look him a dude not a chick. He tells me tease throws the flowers on the ground. I sat there just shocked. Guy sends me a text a week later wish you would have been a girl with all that teasing. I was about 15 and had $115 from saving and Xmas money. I was looking through listings for guitars, and someone had posted a square Telecaster for $100. I text the number, saying I'm interested. Guy says he still has it, but wants $120 for it. I respond saying $110 is as high as I want to go. He says $120 or nothing. I respond saying that if that was the price I'm out. He then proceeded to text me for 3 days calling me an asshole and a piece of shit for not buying a guitar from him, and how good of a deal it was. Saturday rolled around, and the text had stopped, but around 11 p.m., I started getting calls. He was drunk and still mad. At that point, I blocked his number. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.